Good evening, everybody. I apologize for being a little bit late. Uh, on March, the March 11th, 2024 regular meeting of the Melville City Council is now called to order. In, in person participants, I'm reading, I'm just reading the script. All right. uh, in person participants, if you'd like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to the clerk if you're on my right. Remote participants, if you'd like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kels, to give us a roll call, please. Councilmember Grisanti? Here. Councilmember Riggins? Here. Councilmember Silverstein? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Here. Mayor Uring? Yes. You have a quorum. Thank you for any any speaker cards? I do not have any speaker slips and, and we do not have any raised hands or participants on Zoom. Okay, we're now going to recess to closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We'll reconvene around 6.30, begin the regular session, and you'll get a closed session report. So thank you very much. We're off to closed session.
Hi, Chris. Good. Thanks for calling, Mark. That was great. That was very impressed.
No, I had a, a little mishap the two days. Everybody, thank you all for joining us. The March 11th, 2024 regular meeting of the Melville City Council is now called to order. In-person participants, if you would like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to our clerk over here on my right. Remote participants, if you'd like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and then raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kelsey, can we please have a roll call, please? Councilmember Grisanti? Here. Councilmember Riggins? Here. Councilmember Silverstein? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Here. Mayor Uri? Here. You have a quorum. Very good. Uh, Robert, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Um, I, pledge I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands. stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Trevor, can we get a closed session report? Yes. At uh, 5.30 p.m., the City Council met in open session, recessed to closed session. All five council members were present, and no reportable action was taken. Okay. May I get a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on March 1st, 2024, with the amended agenda posted on March 8th, 2024. Thank you very much. Good job. Approve, may I get a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda, but I have a request for a change, if others are agreeable to it. I'd like to ask that we hear 6D and 7A following the consent calendar. Anybody got a comment? Why don't we just put let's put C in there too? Just they're all six C D and seven. Yeah. So sk skip A and six A and, and six B until after the other items. Yeah, I'll mix. I'll second that. Well, wait. So after consent, are we? Is item four A on the agenda tonight? No, no. So wouldn't six? We'd go to C, D, and 7A, and then come to 6A and B if we have time, which we probably will. But that's the, that's the motion. Sure, I'll second that. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, no opposed? Got nobody opposed? We're, we're moving. All right. Let's go back. I don't believe we have any... Presentations this evening? Correct. You don't have any presentations so this evening. That moves us right to written or all communication with the public. So if you've come to speak, now is your chance. you got to speak on items that are not on the agenda. Uh, so let's start off with Rob, John Hogansfeld. Good evening, John. How are you today? Thank you, Council Member. <laughs> and uh, good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, my name is John Honigsfeld. I've lived here in Malibu for 30 years. When I uh, retired, I started going to the Malibu Senior Citizen Center in this building, and I started taking classes in the Emeritus Program from Santa Monica College here in, in this building. And last year, when the college uh, opened up uh, next door in their new building, all the emeritus classes went over to that, 
the Santa Monica College Emeritus class has all moved over to the new building of Santa Monica College, and I went over there with them. But uh, I've been kicked out of Santa Monica College uh, a week ago. I, I can't go back. I can't go there. Um, why? I, I, have, I have right of center views. I, I don't want to go into, I don't want to say too much. I just have right of center views, and I express them, especially in the current events class, which, of course, is a class intended for politics. I was, to be fair to them, I was given many warnings, but I didn't heed any of them. And that's about all I, that's about all I want to say. I don't expect any of you to do anything to help me. I just get it out there so people know what's happening at Santa Monica College next door. You're not responsible for the college, I understand that, but you'd like to know what's happening in your community. And I just like to tell you. Who asked okay. you to leave the professor? Pardon? Who asked you to leave the professor? Well, I'm not, it's I'm, a little complicated. Of course, the professor was involved in making the decision, uh, but the administration in Santa Monica actually made the decision. Yes, that's they were the ones. He recommended it probably, and Santa Monica campus made the final decision. Okay. Thank you. Don't let that silence you. All right, next speaker is e Eden. Eden, you're up. Hello, Malibu City Council. My name is Eden Middlesdorf, and I'm a junior at Pepperdine University. I'm also one of the captains of the women's cross country and track team, and a few of my teammates are actually here tonight. Um, I'm here to speak on an incident that occurred last Tuesday, March 5th. My teammates and I were running during our normal Pepperdine cross country team official practice from campus down to Malibu Lagoon area. Upon arriving, we were, we were verbally harassed and then chased for 45 minutes by a local homeless man. This started when he questioned our running attire, stating if he was our dad, he would never let us leave the house like this, and then started cursing and becoming more violent. The attack started at the lagoon and then ended at Alfred's Coffee in the Country Mart. He chased after us, yelling obscenities and verbally threatening our lives. I unfortunately became, came face to face with him outside of Sun Life where I was waiting for the police to come. He threatened my life while holding a cup of boiling water and attempted to throw it at me. Luckily, I was able to get away safely after running for my life. When the police responded to our cries of help, they told us there was nothing they could do to apprehend the man. And I found myself trying to, lose every, trying to use every last ounce of energy to prove my reasonable fears to the sheriffs. Multiple witnesses soon began to gather and argue with the officers on the scene, explaining the horror of what they had just seen. However, the officers explained that since none of us were hurt and he did not specifically say how he was going to kill us, there was nothing that they could do to apprehend the man. I am not sure exactly what provoked him to charge after us in the first place, but I do know that this is unacceptable. I chose to go to Pepperdine and feeling a sense of home and community here in Malibu, and unfortunately, after this incident, I do not feel safe. My teammates and I can no longer go for a run along, along Malibu Road or smell the salty breeze of the ocean air in the lagoon without feeling a sense of panic. I have run roughly 2,000 miles in the past three years on this route, and I've never felt unsafe until now. The man is still out there, and as a victim, I feel as though my concerns and fears were swept under the rug during this situation. I come before all of you today begging for change. I should not have to fear my life every time I go out for a run. And I would not wish this experience on any other young woman just walking or running around Malibu. Safety and well-being should be this city's first priority, and I want to believe that it still is. I appreciate all of you for listening to me and your time, um, and I hope you can strongly consider this need for change because it should not be like this. So thank you. Thank you very much. Get right ahead. Uh, Ian, I believe uh, the sheriff uh, is going to make a comment on this. Right. I sent him a note uh, about what you had, so I think he's going to be making a comment. And I read your letter. I mean, yeah. so you're, you've made, you've made your, your point. point. We will see what we can do. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, oh. No, 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 don't no, no. Do that. Okay. <laughs> Take a seat, but just wait till all the comments are done, and we'll make sure you, you hear from everyone. All right, Michael, you're up next. Michael Shane, followed by... Robert Brinkman, Michelle. Robert, you're up front, and Michelle Shane. 
followed by Robert Brinkman, followed by Lloyd. And then after Lloyd, we will have Karen. Hello, council members. Uh, I'm here today uh, per my email to all of you uh, last week. Uh, the film 21 Miles of Malibu has now garnered nine awards. Uh, the Malibu High Middle School and Malibu High PTA are going to do a screening May 1st. Calabasas has reached out to me to do a screening, as have a number of other areas around uh, Malibu, and basically because they're all feeders to PCH. I feel that my film, we have to go in and make a few changes to update it, but I feel that my film could be a great vehicle for the city by having the city as one of our sponsors for this film and being a story that's about Malibu for Malibu. It only makes sense that the city uh, supports it. So I've come here before you from for during public comments to present it to you and ask you if you would consider doing this and if I could submit a full proposal. I did give you a slight outline of four different tiers in my email to you and would like very much to continue working on making this film uh, the film that creates the change that's necessary in the sense that if we bring this into young children, into our teenagers, into our kids that are about to learn to drive and get them to watch the film and have a discussion. And my long-term goal is to gamify the education because our core audience of young people today, 15, 16, 17-year-olds, are big gamers. And if you can turn the education of, of driving into a game and an understanding of the changes in the road and rules, you can in, in turn teach them and they will learn without having to try, without anyone lecturing to them. So what I'm hoping I will accomplish by being here today is to push your interest and get in front of you and present you and get Malibu to partner with Sheen Gang Pictures and the other people involved in the film. I thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Michelle. Robert, Mr. Brinkman, you're up next. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Euring and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stewart and Council Members Silverstein, Riggins and Grisanti. I'm here tonight to thank you uh, for paying attention to our issue, the Malibu Marlins. Your attention and your questions have brought about change instantly. The Thursday after uh, the last meeting, three days after you started asking questions, uh, there was a sea change in the city. We got a call that there are lanes available in the pool, and uh, on Monday following, that's Monday of last week, we had a contract and we're an official city vendor. On Wednesday, the website went live and uh, we had offered um, a certain number of uh, places based on the lanes that they had originally given us and three swimmers per lane that sold out in eight minutes. We've since gotten more lanes several times. And uh, at this point, uh, we could only offer two programs because we only got a limited number of times, so we can't accommodate very small kids and we kept our masters in the mornings. But in the two main groups, kids uh, 8 to 13, we signed up 28 swimmers. By the way, the Sea Wolves signed up five in the similar group. And in the older group, the 12 to 17, we signed up 12 swimmers, which is still double what the Sea Wolves have. You gave the community a chance to choose. You gave them a choice, and they made this choice. And the reason I'm the only representative here tonight is because everybody else is by the pool for their first official uh, Malibu Marlins swim training with Coach Eric. And that's all thanks to you. We're all very grateful. And uh, somebody just sent me an email to say that I should also mention that we're very grateful that you gave our children the opportunity to participate in the uh, democratic process. They came here and bravely made their point. They felt heard. They saw change, and they learned a very, very, very valuable lesson, which we hope to continue uh, with our dem democratically elected board uh, that f follows those same principles. And again, I think this is a beautiful example of uh, 
city government being responsive to its residents, citizens, and uh, making change for the better happen. Thank you very much. Robert, thank you very much. May I ask a question? You did good. You, Robert, you got a question coming up here. Just one second. Sure. I was just wondering, um, are you running a competitive where you're going to go to meets and other programs like yes. that also? Yeah. Okay. That is in the plan. So. That is definitely the plan. But the, the main difference is that our program isn't geared only to those swimmers, that we welcome everybody in the community, even the kids who don't want to swim competitively, who just want to do it you know, for sport or uh, for their health or because they enjoy it. Um, and, but anybody who wants to participate will go to, uh, to um, a meets, and we certainly have those swimmers. OK, great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Lloyd, you're up, okay. followed by Karen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Lloyd Ahern. I am the president of the Los Tunas Homeowners Association. And down in the East End, we're having a new problem that has risen. And it's been a while, around for a while, but it's really started to become into focus now. And what I'm here to ask is the city council help us. There's a good thing called the Topanga Lagoon Restoration Project that's going to happen at Topanga Canyon and Pacific Coast Highway and on Topanga Beach. They are going to make, they're going to widen the, the uh, mouth of the uh, lagoon. They're going to take the bridge, which is 79 feet long now, and make it 460 feet. And this is the real kick, one of the real kickers. They're going to make it a five-year project, which they're admitting to five years. So when Caltrans and the big guys admit to five years, you know that's seven to eight. They've got, they're going to do, they've already proven down at, at Trancas they're having a big problem with the bridge because their bridge is a, a, a year and a half um, over, over uh, budget right now, and the lagoon is a real problem that they did here at Surfrider because it's breaching to the east and taking out uh, the uh, Adamson house slowly. So what I'm asking for is there's a EIR deadline of April 12th. And what I want the city to do, and uh, Steve Uring, the mayor's letter, this is you, Steve McClary, sir, write a letter to the, the address that I give you and ask them, why have they not come to Malibu? They had a, a, the IR meeting at, uh, at the Annenberg House and they had one up at Topanga Historic Society. But this thing is right on our city line and inside our city line also, and they haven't come to you. Councilman Grisanti was there at one of the meetings, and uh, Dennis Smith was at one up in... Uh, in uh, Topanga, they, the, there's enough little information. I think Dennis, you're aware of it. I mean, uh, uh, Doug, you're aware of it also. So what I, we need is to get our letter in to the EI, for the EIR and say, why haven't we been consulted? Because environmental impact report, there's going to be a huge impact because there's going to be lanes closed for a long time, and it's going to be a real mess. Thanks. Thank you, Lloyd. You're up, my friend. Good evening, City Council. Um, I'm here to give you an update on the Malibu Education Foundation grant. Um, I sent along some slides, but uh, I I'm going to walk through just the top line. Um, for those who may not be aware uh, in the public, um, just a little background. Uh, a grant was approved in January. Um, to support three areas of focus in support of our public schools, um, establishing a Malibu Education Foundation, and then uh, creating parity with surrounding schools and school districts by implementing an athletics pathway and maintaining instructional aids at our two public elementary schools. And I'm happy to report um, that we're on track 
against the KPIs that were established associated with the grant. Um, and $200,000 of the grant has been received and we almost have access to it at the bank. They hold it for a bit of time. Um, but I wanted to share just some key achievements that, um, that, that we've achieved in the first 60 days of our efforts. Um, with the Malibu Education Foundation specifically, uh, it's been established as a legal entity. Uh, legal operating nonprofit entity, um, and we're just waiting for the 501c3 um, to be approved. Um, we've established an officer team and a board of directors and a financial protocol to follow uh, associated with everything. We have a consultant in place who's working on the three year strategy and business plan. He's currently uh, meeting with key stakeholders across the community to gather information to create the foundation for that plan. Um, we have established alignment with other fundraising entities associated with the schools and we'll continue to work on that. And we have a draft job description for the executive director. But the real exciting part is the athletics pathway. It has launched and our KPI, our goal was to have 60 students participate and register. We have 130 students registered and participating in uh, middle school athletics. That's nearly half, that's 49% of our student population in middle school. Um, and we intended to create three competitive teams. We now have six. So we have boys soccer, two boys soccer, a girls soccer, two volleyball and a track and field. So thank you again for supporting this effort and I'll continue to keep you updated. Thank you very much, you're doing good. Thank you. Uh, anybody online? There's uh, seven raised hands. Seven, seven raised hands. Versus Correct. Howard Rudsky. Howard, you're up, go ahead. <clears throat> good evening. Uh, myself and quite a few Malibu residents would like to congratulate Yolanda Bundy she was named Sustainability Director of the Year, and she's fantastic, and we'd like to commend her on all her hard work, and again, congratulations. Thank you, Eric. We're gonna try and do a presentation for her next meeting, so I appreciate your comment. Who's next? We should give her... <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, you got okay. more? Howard? Okay, good night. We had asked him to mute again, but he has not responded. Oh, okay, sorry. I said we should give her a car. I was half joking. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll, send, we'll send her over to your house to pick it up. Okay, <laughs> who's next? Andy O'Brien. <laughs> Who, hello, who's the, what's his name? Your name? Andy O'Brien. Go ahead, you're on. Andy, you're unmuted. Hey, Andy's not talking. Who's next? Brenton Torrent. Brendan, you're on. Go ahead. Brenton, you're unmuted. Okay, let's try to keep going down the line. We'll find somebody that wants to talk. Rex Uden. Rex. And these are all good. Yeah. Okay, Rex is out. Who's next? Look, we got and, Andy Lyon. Andy, you're on. Andy will speak. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Hello. Um, I, I, uh, I'm really upset with what. Paul, Marianne, and Doug did with the skateboard park, the skate park situation last week. Um, the fact that we have the item 4A has been pushed to an, an undetermined time, that, that appeal from Scott Gillen, which the city staff recommended denying, was not heard by the public. And you guys just went ahead and you, you folded for Scott Gilden and gave him everything he wanted and more. And so you guys 
have now, you know, it's lucky that the pool people didn't have a developer next door. They got what they wanted and those kids are fine. But it came down to the end. My son, my six year old son was last man standing against Gillen and Gold and you guys turned your, you know, just like threw him under the bus. Um, and it was so deceptive in, in your, your, you know, Matt Meyerhoff's uh, press relief. So it's a great day for Malibu and it, it, it makes it go forward faster. We already had an approved skate park plan. It went through all the process. It was ready to go. There's nothing delaying it but Scott Gillen. And so, you know, so here we go. Now we're, we're going to wait more. And like all this stuff where, oh, there's no changes to skate park. There's definitely changes to the features. Nobody, and, and then the, the, the trees, and you're asking questions of the people that are like selling the trees. Like, are these going to do anything? No, it's no problem. Nobody ever wanted trees in the skate park. So the only thing that's getting pushed forward and made faster is Scott Gillen getting to put his trees on that lot. But the, the other thing, I had a picture that I'd sent in, and I don't know if it's, it doesn't seem to be coming up, but the, the, the parking agreement that you guys signed off on you had a picture that's attached to that settlement agreement, and in that it. it says that um, the photo shows that it's for the construction office and storage, and there's a security gate. But the the photo that you used during the description that staff put into the staff uh, pro the thing in the beginning showed just an outline. So I want some clarity from the from the city attorney because it says that he can continue to access property and park as he does and has been, and that there will be no parking um, after hours or on the weekends. But if you're storing stuff, that doesn't count as parking. So I wanna know what's going on because I told some of the Little League people that this is taking away their parking on, on full time. So he's getting to use this as a storage shed and storage unit, he's going to take all his stuff that's behind his wall and put it on that lot. And he's going to get to continue to park everywhere on Bluffs Park. So I want the city attorney and the planning guy to explain exactly what goes on in that parking situation. If it's parking or is it a storage parking? Thank storage you, Mr. 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 Mayor, thank, I, thank you very much. I can address that. There, there is not storage allowed on there. It's only parking that's allowed. And it's only Monday through Friday. The yeah. agreement. The agreement says that. Yes, it's only allow. It only allows for parking. It doesn't allow for storage. Okay. All right. Anybody else online? Rex Uden. Rex, he was on earlier, right? Was he? Uh, the last hand then is Joe Drummond. Joe, go ahead. Hi, Joe. How are you? Good. Good. Um, I am, I, uh, I am here. I'm actually in Toronto. I left Big Rock Drive at 445 this morning to try and turn left on PCH, but there was a huge, massive slide. Um, and I'd like to have an update on that slide and whatever's happening with all the slides along Big Rock and the PCH. I know that is south of where our dewatering equipment is, so there's no dewatering where that slide is happening. And um, I just wanted to agree with Andy Lyon that I do think that there is going to be more of a delay now with the skate park because of the settlement. Um, also, I, I want to congratulate Karen from the Shark Fund for everything and, and thank the city immensely for the donation to the school. That was excellent and that the middle school teams are are actually starting. That's great. Um, I, Karen didn't mention that there is a fundraiser this Sunday at the Malibu Tennis Racket Club, where on on St. Patrick's Day at 4 p.m. and I think you can probably find the information on the website, the Malibu High website and the Shark Fund website to to come and join. It should be great. And um, also, we are doing our. I know probably Marianne will announce this, but we are doing our Point Doom Preserve weeding this Wednesday from 9 to noon. So I hope everyone can come out and bring their gardening gloves and 
do that. So a lot of things, but anyway, I hope we can get some answers on the slides that were happening and it's, it hasn't been, it like it rained not as much as normal, but I guess this is all the saturation from all the rain. So I just hope we can get some answers there. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Say hello to my friends in Toronto. Anybody else? Those are all the hands raised at the time the item was called. Okay. Thank you very much. We're moving back now to the dais. Uh, City Manager, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, wanted to just to note to the council, I know that we've shared a little information about the to make the Topanga restoration, uh, the Lagoon re restoration program. Uh, we will be bringing something forward to City Council in terms of a comment letter on the EIR. Um, just wanted to assure the, the public that uh, uh, the State Parks has been keeping the city in, informed throughout that process. Uh, they have scheduled several presentations with us. Uh, we'll make sure that we uh, are, are doing everything we can to forward that information out to the council and the public. Super. Uh, also wanted to, to thank Howard Rutsky for the acknowledgement of our Environmental Services Director, Yolanda Bundy. Uh, we, will, we will be scheduling a presentation to recognize her for uh, the award that she did receive from the uh, state. Um, and then I just want to report on what is happening with the storms. This actually was part of my report. so. Uh, obviously, we're continuing to have some issues with the uh, slides that are impacting traffic throughout town. Uh, currently, we're dealing with the slide affecting um, some, really both directions of traffic on PCH near Big Rock that, uh, that occurred overnight. Um, right now, um, as of 6.20 p.m., uh, one westbound lane is open and two eastbound lanes are open. Uh, they've had to close the lanes that are uh, closest to the hillside. Uh, and they've put a protective K-rail there, so they're uh, running the westbound traffic through the median through that location. Uh, Caltrans did have a geologist out, and they uh, used a drone to take a look at the situation to determine that there's some fracturing up on the slope. Um, we do not have an, an ETA on when they will be able to uh, complete that work and open up the, any of the other lanes. Uh, just as a note, even though um, uh, even though the rain may be subsiding or, or maybe stopping, uh, we're, we're still in a uh, period, of, a threat period here in terms of slides. So uh, even if we look outside and we see clear weather, um, there's still, we're still in a, in a risk situation here. So even with no further rain, we could still be looking at some additional slides coming down and impacting our roadways. Uh, moving on, um, last, week, uh, last week we hosted a meeting at Malibu City Hall, City Hall along with the Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem uh, with the new State Park Superintendent for this area, Richard Fink. Uh, the, uh, the local region had been without a, a permanent superintendent for the last couple of years, uh, so we're very uh, eager to meet Mr. Fink uh, and hear about what he's been working on. Um, one of the things that they announced was that uh, they are they are planning to uh, abide by the city's pesticide and herbicide free policy on all state on all state park properties in the Malibu city limits. Uh, this, as you know, addresses a concern that had been brought previously by a number of residents regarding the use of herbicides on some state park lands in the city. So we had a good meeting and a good partnership. Uh, I think is is underway there. Uh, I have a number of updates to share from the city's community services department with council and public. Uh, first, our, for our youth commission, the Harry Borowski Memorial Youth Commission application deadline has been extended to April 19th. Uh, students in grades 7 through 12 uh, during the 24-25 academic school year who reside or attend a Malibu school are encouraged to apply. Information is available on the city's website at malibucity.org slash youth commission. Malibu, speaker, li Malibu Library Speaker Series, the next Malibu Library Speaker Series features our next uh, art, commission, art exhibit opening. Arts Commission will open its next art exhibit featuring Lee McClowski at the Malibu City Gallery on Sunday, March 24th. The event begins at noon and will include a display of over 15 oil paintings and a question and answer session with the artists. The exhibition will be on display until May 3rd. Uh, on the swim team, uh, staff continues to work with the Park and Recreation Commission Ad Hoc Committee to find a resolution between the two SWIM organizations. Uh, the meeting uh, that took place on March 4th between the Presidents and the Ad Hoc Committee uh, took place and a follow-up meeting is scheduled with the entire board of both organizations this week. Uh, the Ad Hoc Committee will provide an update at the Park and Recreation Commission regular meeting on Tuesday, March 19th. 
Regarding swim team programming, as you heard last week, an, om an opening became available at the Malibu Community Pool, and staff worked with the Malibu Marlins swim, swim team to secure swim lanes for their program. They will be using the pool five days a week beginning today. On Pacific Coast Highway, of course, we continue to uh, work with our legislative partners to support a, a bill to bring speed cameras uh, to Malibu. Uh, we're looking at a potential committee date in Sacramento in early April to hear that. So we're continuing to work on that. Also, we have uh, on the consent calendar, we have a, a letter uh, supporting, uh, supporting a, a, an effort by Supervisor Horvath's office uh, to um, bring a Gen AI solution for traffic mobility insights. So that's on the agenda for your on the consent calendar. Also last week, uh, there was a special meeting of the Planning Commission um, to address the um, crosswalk at uh, 22521 Pacific Coast Highway. I'm happy to report that the um, Planning Commission reheard that item and they did approve it 5-0 on Saturday evening. Also wanted to announce that um, there is an upcoming uh, online town hall meeting for uh, to talk about wildfire and disaster insurance. This is going to be hosted by the Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara, Assembly Member Jackie Irwin, and the Las Virginas Malibu Council of Governments. This is a virtual event. It will be April 4th, 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Information will be posted on the city's website. And last week I also attended a meeting of our, uh, for the COG for the uh, Technical Advisory Committee. We had a meeting with our, uh, with our law enforcement partners and uh, so a lot of good efforts being ma being made right now. Um, I know we've, we've we've heard recently from uh, Captain C2 on on all their work uh, with the uh, integrated uh, real time disaster center. Uh, so we had a good meeting to hear everything that's going on with public safety. And then also last Thursday attended the 36th annual city managers education seminar hosted by the sheriff's department uh, through their contract law enforcement bureau. Uh, heard a report from Sheriff Robert Luna. Um, he announced that they uh, graduated 350, um, applic uh, 350 persons from their Sheriff's Academy this past year, uh, and they're hoping to be able to add another 800 in the coming year. Uh, he noted that um, recruitment and retention uh, re remain a, a top concern for the department. That is it for my report. I know we have uh, Sergeant Sutherland here for a report from the Sheriff's Department. We have to answer any questions. Any questions? Anybody? Oh, no. Marianne? Um, you had talked that staff was going to put together a response to the EIR. Is there a chance that some of those meetings might be able to be held here in Malibu? Could we? Sure, I'd be happy to bring that request uh, to the coordinator uh, and see if they could schedule a, a future meeting here in Malibu. Happy I think to... that'd be very helpful to our residents. I will, I will bring that and... request to them. Oh, the, um, the Big Rock road closure. I, I saw a brief picture. It looked like it was right by the signal. Are we actually worried about a greater area than that? Um, how far is that closure? I'll, do, I'll ask our Public Works Director, Rob DeBow, to come to the microphone. I know he's been working with his staff and coordinating with Caltrans on that today. I understand that um, any of our steep hills are subject to this, but at this current time, what's the kind of lane closure on that one? Yeah, it's it's roughly from the intersection, and I would be give, I would be guessing the length of it since I haven't been out there, but I've seen pictures of it. It goes pretty far to the east, and they're currently putting K rail out there to block traffic or prevent the, the debris from getting further into the lanes. So they're doing that, and that's going to be a kind of permanent until they are able to kind of assess, make sure no more further rocks are falling from that area. Thank you. And I would just encourage our residents, um, sign up for notifications. Um, I know I received uh, double notif or three notifications, one from the sheriff and two from different notifications that I'm signed up for the city. You can just go to the city's website and on the left-hand side, go to um, e-notifications and sign up for the various things that the city has. And then that way you'll get it in your email box. You'll get it by text. You'll get a phone call. 
um, as soon as those um, notifications are released by the city so that you can stay up to date on everything that's going on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Sergeant, you're up, please. If in your presentation, you could take a moment to address the young lady's concerns about running. That would be helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. So, uh, first thing uh, we've talked about already, but the slide, we've been out since last night directing traffic. Um, and the VOPs have helped out tremendously, so everyone knows what's going on with that. Hopefully, um, they can open that soon. Um, last week, uh, there was a pursuit that came through Malibu. I'm sure everyone saw it on TV of a stolen box truck from Lowe's uh, that started with the Los Angeles Police Department. And they had a helicopter uh, that was able to track it through Malibu. Uh, their ground units disengaged uh, from the pursuit and they went into surveillance mode, it's called, where the helicopter just tracks it. Um, that truck went up into Ventura County and then that's where the suspect was apprehended. Um, then about six hours later on that same day, uh, the deputies from Lost Hills were in a pursuit of a kidnapping suspect that started down the street here in front of the Ralphs at uh, Webway and PCH, and I was part of that. Um, it started off as a domestic violence in progress inside of a moving vehicle. The car came to a stop in the parking lot there. Um, the female came out screaming, he kidnapped me, he kidnapped me and the driver took off. Uh, we pursued that vehicle all the way into Santa Monica and it got onto the 10 freeway and then exited a few miles later and the driver started uh, running in, uh, red lights at an unsafe speed about 40 miles an hour. So due to the public safety, we had to cancel that pursuit. Fortunately though, it wasn't a real kidnapping. It was a husband and wife. They were having an argument and she said that because she was angry because her husband wouldn't take her where she wanted to go. So fortunately, nobody was injured and the kidnapping was not real. So um, next uh, item on February 29th, the Tracy Park Gallery was vandalized by a um, homeless individual. He threw rocks through the windows of the gallery and smashed all the windows, causing about $10,000 worth of damage. Um, the deputies immediately responded and detained him, and he freely admitted to doing it. Um, he was having some mental health issues, so he was arrested for felony vandalism. However, due to zero bail policy, he was cited out. Uh, fortunately, our mental evaluation team was able to take him to a hospital to involuntarily commit him there for 72 hours. Um, so yeah, he's hopefully not in Malibu anymore. <laughs> um, next, I have the crime stats for uh, February. Uh, so in February, we had uh, 70 part one crimes, which compares to 75 from this time last year, which is a 7.1% decrease. So again, we're going in the right direction uh, with de decreasing crime. Um, our crime analyst was able to uh, get two DNA hits from previous crimes which happened, so I'm going to give you some highlights of that one. So in this one, a residential burglary occurred in Malibu on September 19, 2022, and in this case, a residence was burglarized in Malibu. A window was shattered to gain entry, uh, resulting in a large amount of broken glass. And in the process, the suspect cut himself on the glass and the uh, DNA uh, was taken from the blood that was on a dresser in the master bedroom uh, that was ransacked. And the DNA uh, came back with a match to a suspect by the name of Deontay Kirksey with a birth date in 1988. His last known address was, he was a transient in Los Angeles. Uh, he's a parolee, a documented gang member. He has extensive criminal history for burglary, robbery, contempt of court, possession of a firearm, driving a suspended license, parole violations. Um, he's also wanted in a case that occurred in San Diego and one that occurred in Laverne for burglaries. So there is a warrant out for his arrest. And in another case, this one 
was in October of 2022. Another house was burglarized. Um, the house was unoccupied for three days uh, because it had just been put on the market for sale and it was still f fully furnished. Uh, in this case, the realtor went inside to host an open house and a male was found inside. The male fled the location, but the male had been squatting in the house for the three days and he used most, multiple household items, including a towel, which he showered with. And DNA was able to be taken from the towel that he used and it resulted in his identification. Uh, this suspect named Michael Mack, uh, born 1985, with a last known address in Connecticut. Uh, he's got no criminal history in California, but he's a conv convicted felon out of Connecticut. And he's got priors for possession of controlled substance, resisting arrest, forgery, assault, robbery, and burglary. So again, another solve on that one. So a warrant is in, placed into the system for his arrest. Um, <clears throat> Now I'm going to talk about the incident with the Pepperdine cross country girls. So first of all, um, I'm sorry you had to experience that. No one should have to go through that. So I was informed of the incident the following morning. And in this incident, um, it was like she said, it took about 45 minutes for the entirety, right? And it started in the Malibu Lagoon, which is California State Parks jurisdiction. And there was actually two calls for service that we had because of the time frame. And the original deputy that went for the first call wasn't the same deputy that went for the second call. In addition, the girls got separated during the incident. And so the full story of what happened in its entirety wasn't easily seen at the time when the deputies were there on scene. Uh, also, the incident in the lagoon was the California State Parks officer's jurisdiction to investigate. So as soon as I found out about the incident the next morning, I assigned a deputy to conduct follow-up investigation. And the deputy reached out to the girls and took a report and got the full story together. And a criminal reports incident was taken. And it's being assigned to a detective today. And they will be following up with the, the girls from Pepperdine and the detective will present the case to the district attorney for filing and then we'll be able to go apprehend that suspect. Thank you very much. That's good. I've got one, one last thing. Um, can you put up on the uh, screen there? So uh, in talking about crime and deterring crime and solving crime, um, our sheriff's department Lost Hill Station is the first sheriff station in the county to roll out this real-time crime and disaster center. And so part of it is a camera registry, which we're rolling out. And the camera registry um, is going to enable us to solve crimes a lot more efficiently and quicker. So basically what, what this program does is you as a private citizen, you register your camera in our registry here you put your contact information in how many cameras you have where they're located and what they you know what they're facing whether it's the front yard backyard etc and we don't have access to your cameras we can't go into your cameras and look basically what happens is if a crime occurs and say you're the next door neighbor for where that crime occurs we can go onto a map and it will show all the cameras registered in this registry on that map near this location and we can say hey um, you know, Joe, you have a camera here and it's right next door to where a burglary happened. Can you check your camera on this date and time and see if you captured the suspect, you know, whether it's on foot or in a vehicle and we'll send you a link, which will upload to our digital evidence and you'll be able to upload the video into our digital evidence for the detective to look at. So, uh, this is the first program of its kind for the Sheriff's Department and Lost Hill Sheriff Station is rolling it out and I highly encourage everybody to register the cameras. It doesn't matter residential business, we take it all. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has anything. Questions, guys? I, I, I just want to thank you for, for making it clear that you don't have the capability of going into the, cam the cameras. Uh, I talked to a guy yesterday who saw the article in the paper and he misunderstood it that you could be sitting there watching his cameras all the time. I go, no, that's not it. And unfortunately, the part that laid that out in the newspaper article was on a second page further on in the paper. 
So you got to keep hammering the point that we don't have access to your cameras, but it's nice to know who has a camera so that we can contact you and say, hey, your neighbor got robbed. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, two things. First off, I, I think I was one of the first people to sign up for the camera, so uh, I wholeheartedly endorse it. And, you know, you realize uh, when you see TV, some of these crime shows, how important it is to have those cameras. It's, it's evidence that's irrefutable. Uh, second uh, comment I have for the uh, comfort of the Pepperdine students, you do know who the suspect is, and you, do you know where he is? Well, he's, a, he's a transient that's yeah. local in the area, but we do, we have identified him, yes. Okay. So once the warrant's, once the warrant's done, he's, he's caught. Good. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Bruce? No? Anybody? Me? Marianne? Um, so since there were multiple jurisdictions, there was the state parks, there was the sheriff's deputies. Sounds like at the time of the incident occurring, there maybe wasn't just a clear picture, as you said, for the deputies that were responding. Right. It, it was pretty much unfortunate timing the way it all played out. But And the cameras could possibly help with this because maybe the commercial areas will sign up their cameras Absolutely. on that. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, does Pepperdine have uh, a security program for off-site or is it just on-site their campus themselves? And maybe the ladies could help me also. So the Pepperdine Public Safety is just responsible for their campus. Um, I don't know if they advise them that when they leave the campus where they're going, that might be something, you know? Well, I'm sorry to pile this onto public safety and our things, but you know, I think they are part of our community and it needs to be a collective thing. Maybe it's some time we can work to work with Pepperdine, work with state parks, work with the sheriff's deputies to get a more cohesive uh, unit. So no matter where you are in the city um, or at just outside the city, that safety level is there um, and we can have a better communication path between everybody. Um, you know, there was the, the death in Georgia of Lake and Riley and she was just out running on the campus. So I think this is something that everybody needs to be aware of. And ladies, do whatever you can. Good thing you have your cell phones, whistles, protect yourself. You know, unfortunately, maybe have some of the guys run with you too to, to just help deter that. And I, I, as a woman, I hate that to give you that advice that you have to have a man next to you to be safe, but that may just be something that you also have to do. So best of luck and I hope to see you out there running still. Running groups though, regardless of what you do. Thank you. I take exception to this idea of having a man run with them. I don't. I, I, <laughs> hey, I, I do too, but. You think we're going to slow you down? Joke. Okay. <laughs> Doug, you, you have anything? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, just one, one, two quick, one quick question. Not this Sunday, prior Sunday, there apparently was a car show down in, in uh, the Palisade someplace. Okay. And when that show ended, I mean, PCH was a racetrack all day long. I mean, do you guys keep track of when those car shows are taking place? Do you, do you get notice of those, or does somebody look them up? So normally they are they notify us. Um, the okay. last one was um, an Audi event, and I assigned two deputies to monitor that. Is that the one in the Palisades? I don't know where it started. Okay. They went to across the street here uh, in the morning, and then they went up to um, Westward Beach after that. Okay. But I assigned the deputy to shadow them the entire time. So when yeah. they know when they notify us, I always make sure we have enforcement nearby. Cool. Just if you know there's a car show, you know they're going to be speeding. I exactly. mean, it, it, it goes hand in glove. Okay. Anybody else? Are we doing general comments or just to the sheriff? The sheriff right now. We're doing that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Back to the council table. Anybody want to start? Marianne, you were. Sure. So, gentlemen, uh, Karen, could you come up to the mic? Councilmember Riggins, your microphone. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Joe mentioned the weed pulling event at um, Point Team Headlands on Wednesday. That's March 13th at 9 a.m. Bring your gloves, uh, bring bodies. It's a fun time out there. I was hoping Karen could enlighten us a little bit about the fundraiser on oh, sure. the 17th. So um, it's uh, for the Shark Fund, which uh, supports the Malibu Middle and High School, and it's at Malibu Racquet Club, okay. uh, and it's live ball and dinner. 
So if you are a tennis player or know of a tennis player or like to eat dinner, <laughs> um, uh, you can buy tickets on, I'm trying to think of the best place to, if, if you email the sharkfund.org at gmail.com, we can send you the link. Okay. But it's open to the community. And I think we have about 35 tickets left and it's, it's a fun event. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Everybody support our schools. Come on yes. out. Um, I attended a CPA board meeting last week. That's the Clean Power Alliance. And that program is doing very well. Um, they're the largest in the country. Uh, so we're lucky to be a part of that. And our uh, residents in the city of Malibu, we have about a 96% uh, percentage of um, joining in at close to 100% for green power. So we're doing a great job on that. I attended a luncheon put on by the Las, Vegas, uh, Las Virginis Water District uh, last sponsored week, by. sponsored by, excuse me, um, in honor of Women's History Month. And Supervisor Lindsay Horvath uh, served as the moderator with a variety of uh, local leaders providing comments of what women's history means to them. It was a really exciting um, event and uh, just, you know, the, the history that women have contributed to this country is dynamic and I wish it could be recognized for more than just a month. Uh, we participate every day of the year. Um, and I can't even read my own writing here. Oh, um, I'm, I'm happy the Marlins have gotten some swim time out there. Um, and I hope that um, all the board members, the parents, the coaches, the youth of both programs can uh, work to be polite and respectful to one another. I know there's been a lot of acrimony over the last year or so between the two programs, and I just, I hope everyone can do what's best for the children and uh, show the utmost amount of kindness to one another and uh, work together. Uh, it's a small pool, and I also encourage you all to come out and participate in our vacant land survey and let us know that we need a community swimming pool so that we can um, offer these programs in even greater amount. And that's all I have. Thank you. Anybody else, Paul? Sure, I'm going to I'm going to be very short here. I did go to the International Women's Day uh, event that was held in uh, Agoura Hills uh, where Supervisor Horvath was honored. She was the keynote speaker. Uh, also present on the uh, stage was Captain Jennifer C2, who I thought did a great job as usual, and uh, it was very nice, and, and people even talked to me even though I was a guy. Still am. Doug? Or Bruce, excuse me. Okay, thanks. So um, I didn't do much for over the past two weeks other than get ready to move, which, by the way, sorry for the way I'm dressed tonight. All my clothes were packed and my shoes were packed. I'm wearing sandals here. Um, so I'm just going to respond to the public comments from tonight. Um, first of all, thanks, everybody, for, for coming and speaking, for calling in, for writing to us as well. Um, I have a question about protocol, by the way. It's, tonight, everybody was just, like, responding to individual speakers, and I had thought that the protocol was we're supposed to wait until everybody has spoken, and then we address comments. I'm not saying that that's preferred by me. I just want to understand whether there is or isn't a protocol so that we know the rules going forward. I think that, the, that that is the standard protocol is that we receive them all and we don't talk yeah, about them. Yeah, they talk at the end. Okay. So, and that's why I, I didn't say anything to anybody. It doesn't mean that I didn't um, want to say something or ask you questions. I just I honor the protocol. Um, two points about PCH I want to make. Um, one, and these are unrelated to the agenda items. Um, this evening, I was driving um, from this area um, up PCH, um, and when I got to where the synagogue is, Traffic was just de dead stop. I was thinking, oh, we're, we're dealing with this problem again that we had a while ago where it was just crawling. Um, it was only that way for a few moments, or you know, maybe a few seconds even. It just seemed like longer. But then all of a sudden, the traffic started moving again, and it was moving at 35 miles an hour. You know, and it's, a 40, it's, a, it's 50 miles an hour there. It comes down to 40 right before the construction, and then it's 30 at the construction site. And I've been saying for weeks, 
I am concerned when I get to that construction site and I'm driving the speed limit because people are just riding right on my tail and swerving around me. Well, it turns out, and this was great, a sheriff's cruiser was in the middle of the two lanes, you know, driving half in one lane, half in the other, lights on, driving below the speed limit so that when it got down to where the 30 mile an hour zone was, the, the cars were going the right speed. And we got there perfectly fine, you know, just going at the, a little below the speed limit, and it was really safe and really smooth and really nice. And I asked um, the sergeant, you know, what was going on, because I was, I was hoping they were actually experimenting with some traffic coming, and they actually were. They, they were deliberately slowing down the cars so that when they got down to the construction area, they'd be going the right speed. And, I, I, you know, I'm hopeful we could be doing things like that. Um, now, when I was coming back up towards City Hall an hour later, uh, or half hour later, um, I saw a, um, a, a rental truck of some sort, and next to it was a um, car with a huge camera hanging over it in front of the vehicle, like, you know, they were filming. And I was just wondering, actually, if anyone knows if that was a permitted filming event or if that's just something people do on their own, because I was surprised that, to see that happening. There was no police escort. There was no shutting down the lanes. It was just happening. So I just want to comment on that. Um, the comments that we received tonight, John, first of all, um, you know, there's, there's a saying, it's, it's often attributed to Voltaire, but I think it's about Voltaire, that um, I may disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the deaf your right to say it. Um, I'm a pacifist, I don't know that I defend to the deaf your right to say it, but, I, but I'm, a, I'm a staunch First Amendment person, and I think that, uh, I don't know what you said, but if you said it as um, diplomatically as you said it here, so that the tone was, the, the way you said it was right, I, I am offended by people censoring what you have to say. Um, to, it's, it has, I was thinking about this before tonight, and it just gave me an opportunity to say something that I was hesitant to say. Um, it's getting scary out there. I mean, I, I have always felt that the one thing that I could do safely was say something, say whatever I had, to, whatever I believed, because in this country that's protected. And for the most part, the government would protect our right to do it. Um, Cancel culture, censorship, and even now retribution if people say something that someone else who has power disagrees with. It's getting very scary. I, I, ha I, I sometimes self-censor, and I shouldn't have to do that. Nobody should have to do that. And so again, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, um, and thank you for coming here and bringing attention to that. Um, Andy Lyon um, mentioned the, um, the parking issue. Um, I'm actually hoping, depending on how that parking is going, I'm hoping that people will pay attention to how available the lot is to our residents, whether things are being stored there, because the agreement now, that, has the agreement been signed? Is it in place now, the settlement agreement? Okay, so if the settlement agreement's now in place, it, the parking por portion of it is terminable at the city's um, will for cause or for no cause on 30 days notice. So if the parking ends up being a problem for our residents, and I was opposed to agreeing to it in the first place, um, we could bring it back here for a um, direction to the city to, can't, to terminate the contract, the parking portion of the contract. So residents pay attention. If it's becoming a problem for Little League, if it's a problem for the skateboarders, if it's a problem for anyone using the park, let the city know uh, because we're listening. Uh, Michael, Michelle, I'm sorry, Michelle, Shane, who's gone, um, per perhaps um, he, would, he could speak to the city staff, to the city manager, um, see if he can't develop some kind of proposal that the city manager thinks makes sense and bring back to the city council a proposal for us. Um, city manager might think no proposal makes sense, but I, I think that would be a good idea. And also we have a, um, a grant program out of the general fund and an application can be made for that. Steve, you wanted to say something? I just want to report to the council, and I'm sorry, I meant to mention this in my comments earlier. I, I have been in conversation with Mr. Shane, and when we are working on, on considering something that we could bring forward to council. Great. Um, Eden, who also has gone, um, you know, and I just want to say, last week, last meeting, the, all the people came here to speak for the Marlins, and then they, they left after they gave their comments. And I think a lot of them, that I heard afterwards, didn't realize that we would address the comments after we have, when we start speaking. So I suspect maybe the Pepperdine students didn't realize that as well. They, they probably thought everybody had their say already because we didn't follow that protocol of waiting until after everybody had spoke. So anyway, I, what I want to say is, obviously it's a terrible situation. Um, unlike some others on city council and in the community, and I, I've said this over and over again, 
Um, I view the um, unhoused situation from two different directions. One is what, if anything, can we do to help them? That, and that's a, a common theme, and, and I actually believe it's not our responsibility, but if there are things we can do, that's great. But more importantly, from a government standpoint, local government, I believe it's our responsibility to protect our community. To safety and the protection of our community is our, is our number one responsibility. So um, we have tools. We do have, I, I say this over and over, I feel like I'm a broken record. We have a camping ordinance that we adopted that is com that complies with Martin versus Boise. And if there are people living unhoused in the city, especially if they're committing crimes, uh, we need to be tough. We, 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 can, we can provide tough love. And um, I think it's appropriate and necessary in some instances. Uh, Robert, I'm glad things have worked out for the uh, Marlins. And it's actually, there's, a, there's one theme up here that seems common. We, 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 we don't agree on a lot of things. We disagree on some things. But we all agree that the um, children in our community are very important. They're the life's blood of the community. And um, we've had swift action for the Little League with the Snack Shack, where we all unanimously approved ac action. We've had result of us commenting um, movement for the um, swim team, the swim club. Um, we have the school. Um, it was great to hear that the athletic part is, is, me, is exceeding your expectations. So, you know, the one thing that we all care about is the children in our community, and it's great to see that um, we're actually seeing results. And we got the ride in the parade. So, yes, that too. Um, Lloyd, I think your comment has already been addressed by the city manager, and I believe I've responded to all the comments I wanted to say, so thank you. That's my comments. Yeah, you're up. By the way, we do agree on a lot of things, uh, not just the fact that Bruce has got sandals on. That's beside the point. <laughs> um, quick comments here. I'm glad to see the crosswalk uh, got approved last Friday night. Uh, that was very important to show the city's uh, interest in public safety. I realized that um, you know, it was full discussion. I think it took an hour and a half, but it was a 5-0 outcome. Um, glad to see that's behind us. Also, I want to mention the uh, swim team issue. I want to compliment uh, our uh, Parks and Recreation staff. Kristen did a uh, great job there, but especially the ad hoc committee. Dane and Alicia both stepped in and acted as moderators, mediators, whatever you want to call it, and really helped out, did exactly what you expect commissioners to do. Very proud of them and very proud that uh, you know we've got a solution that's working for both parties. I do hope that people realize, and this is a comment that was made to me after the meeting uh, last two weeks ago, the kids are here. And the, they look to see us on this dais, and they look to see the adults that they look up to, and we're the examples to them. So please make sure that uh, they don't walk away going, oh, that's all I need to say about that. We need to be adults and be professional and do our jobs well and make sure the kids are proud of us. All right. Um, as uh, the city manager mentioned, we saw the parks uh, superintendent, very, very impressed by uh, both uh, he and his uh, associate to assistant, I forgot what the exact titles are, but what an addition and uh, glad to see him uh, as, as part of our community now. And they see themselves as part of our community too. Um, cameras, we just talked about the uh, speed cameras, transportation committee on April the 9th. We're making progress on this. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, raise anybody's hopes on it. This is an uphill battle. We're going to do everything we can. We're going to have people there at the transportation committee meeting. Not sure who all is going to go or how we're exactly going to handle it. We just found out today this is taking place. We will. We will advocate for this as well as we can, and um, other people are joining us to try and help us as well. So it's not that we're alone, but it's an uphill climb. Um, Let's see, my meeting schedule, uh, I had a couple of meetings with consultants for our strategic planning meeting and also the vacant land uh, project that we're coming up to. And uh, Yolanda, congratulations on uh, your achievement. You make us all proud. And I have to tell you, it, it is a wonderful comment that we get from city people that have a problem. They go, oh, I talked to Yolanda, and she said, and she's taking care of us, and her staff's taking care of us. It's exactly the kind of customer service that you need for our residents. That's what we're, that's what we're here to do is to make sure the people that live in this town 
get get what they deserve and get the kind of support from the city government. And believe me, the staff is, is more than willing to work on things. It's just a matter of getting to it sometimes, a resource short in some cases. Uh, Karen, please pass along my uh, congratulations to everybody, and especially you. You've been the one that's uh, toted the water on this and uh, very proud of what you guys are doing. Um, you know, the city is only providing seed money, and you, we set some parameters for you. And I looked at your KPIs, and you're ahead or, uh, or equal on all of them, especially the results with the kids. It just shows what a need there is. And to use one of the phrases I use from Harvard Business School, find the need and fill it. And by the fact that you've got 130 kids, half the school's kids signed up for it, just indicates what a need there was and how quickly you guys have risen to the occasion. Thank you very much for that. Um, skate park. Look, um, I know not everybody, you know, you heard, heard a negative comment about it tonight. We're trying to get that skate park built. And you can say what you want to, negative, you should have done it this way, you should have done it that way. The objective is only to get the skate park built. And as often as said, do you have a dog in the fight? Well, there were two, two dogs in the fight. That was the city is the applicant for the skate park and the next door neighbor who's a developer. The settlement agreement was designed to stop that uh, disagreement, put an end to it with a settlement agreement. And honestly, anybody else that sticks your nose into the transaction really doesn't have a dog in the fight. And if, you, if we end up with a lawsuit on this, it's going to stop the skate park, whether it went through the appeal process or not. It's a lawsuit, an extended time, would stop it until it's resolved. So please, for the interest of the kids, do the same thing we're trying to do up here. Get this skate park going and get it behind us. If you want to pick a fight with the city somewhere, fine. Find another place to do it. Let the kids out of it, okay? That's all I got to say. Over to you, Mayor. Thank you, Doug. Okay, a couple things. Uh, I want to, again, echo the Mayor Pro Tem's comments on Yolanda. I mean, she was picked number one out of a group of 10,000 supervisors. Uh, I mean, I don't think I've ever been put in a, a pod of 10,000 people and come out number one. You might find it hard to believe, but it never <laughs> happened. <laughs> uh, Gillen on parking. Trevor, if I read the, stat, the settlement agreement, it says that he can do exactly what he's doing now to park there. It doesn't prohibit him putting any kind of storage on there. Is that correct? No, he's only allowed to have parking on there. Storage was something that was originally allowed in the original agreement. Where does it say it's, that? It's in the it doesn't say that in the settlement agreement. It was removed as a term. It was in the in the former agreement, which which uh, was in place with Mr. Gillen's team. It was removed specifically without a right to have storage. He would not have it. He has to have it specified if he wants to be able to store materials there. But it says he can park the way he was doing in the past. I'm just saying. I, I mean, I think if we're going to do this, we got to be real clear so everybody. There's no ambiguity here. I think they would have a, a very significant issue if they tried to store objects on there, and it's it's clear that they are not allowed to do that. This has been part of the communication. I don't, with them. Know, I don't know how clear it is. Paul, you got a comment? Yeah, they're not allowed to park anything, to leave anything parked there after, what is it, 3.30? Either 3.30 or 4 o'clock, uh, oh, and they're oh, not allowed to have anything there on the weekends. Look, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of real of tight, tight agreements. All I'm saying, if I read the agreement, what it says is they can do what they were doing right now. That's all it says. Now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll they read can't it. leave. They can't leave cars there over the weekend. I'm just. They can't leave cars okay. there at the end of the day. I'm not going to. They we can't did, park overnight there. I'll, I'll read it to you next meeting. I'll, I'll find the agreement and go through it. Okay. Uh, slides. I mean, the people I've talked to about these mudslides, it's, it's not going to get any better real quick. I mean, the story I get is once everything dries out and the land sort of gets, you know, starts pumping stuff up, we could get more of them because more rocks are going to be loose and they may come coming down. So I guess the, end, the, the goal here says just be very careful of what you're doing because I mean, that's just where we are today. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers. Karen, thank you very much. I'm glad you're doing well out there. Keep the good work up. Uh, I think that's good. Uh, I had, again, I, like, Doug, that I had meetings with the two consultants who were doing the our next meeting, the facilitator and the uh, folks who are leading the charge to figure out what we do with the open land. So I hope that thing moves forward. Um, I also had, I got a call last week from the mayor of Agora, 
who was looking to get some information on the fire grants that we have. Uh, and that's outside of, that's a little above my pay grade, so I got a hold of Susan Duenas, who knows this stuff. And we, we had probably an hour conversation with her where we gave her the overview of what we were doing here in the city. So, I mean, thanks, Susan. She was very good. She, she helped us get the information out there that we needed. So I think that worked out very, very well. Okay, speaking of the skate park. And I did want to see the skate park get built. I, I got no problem with moving that thing forward. I just have a problem with the way it transpired. Let me take you through that. In last Monday's council meeting, we witnessed Trevor Rusin and Mary Ann colluding in an action that at best was borderline corruption as they placed developers' interests above those of the city of Malibu. Let me explain that. In our February 27th meeting during discussion of the skate park settlement agreement, the council approved a motion that instructed the city attorney to incorporate an indemnification clause in the settlement agreement he was negotiating with Scott Gillen. The indemnification clause protected the city and our residents from lawsuits in connection with the state part settlement agreement. The indemnification motion, motion voted on required Scott Gillen to pay to defend the city against any lawsuits that were brought in connection with the city's development of the skate park. At that meeting, the motion was clearly articulated. No, nobody was mumbling. Everybody was real clear what we were saying. And the city attorney repeated the motion before the vote was taken. There was no doubt we all understood it. During the discussion of the motion, Councilmember Grisanti requested that the council consider eliminating the indemnification from the settlement agreement, and his request was denied. So Trevor went out to negotiate with Scott Gillen. And sort of being the mediocre attorney that he was, he wasn't able to get the job done. Scott apparently objected to part of the indemnification clause, and instead of following up with the council instructions, Trevor decided to help the developer. According to Trevor, he then called Marianne Riggins at home after the meeting and convinced her that she did not know what she was doing when she made the approved motion for a strong indemnification clause. Apparently, she then agreed with Trevor that she was wrong, and she agreed to change the language of her motion to allow Trevor to remove a portion of the indemnification provision from the settlement agreement. No other city council member was contacted on that decision. As a result of the change, it weakened the protections for the city and strengthened the protection for Scott Gillen. Let me say that again. That decision weakened the decisions for the city. It eliminated our ability to get to defend ourselves, to have Scott Gillen defend us, and it gave more power to Scott Gillen that he didn't have to deal with that. Now, why is all this important? Changes like these are made in secret. There are changes like these that are made in secret erode trust and confidence in the city government. Unilaterally changing the council motion demonstrated that members of this council were willing to protect the interests of a wealthy developer over the interests of the residents. In doing so, they marginalized the voices, voices of our residents. The action demonstrates that our city attorney, who was paid with residents' dollars, cannot be trusted to follow the will of the people as dictated by the city council. Instead, he was willing to remove protections for the city and transfer them to developers. That worries me, and it should also worry you. Noncompliance with the rules starts us on a very slippery slope that leaves residents vulnerable to exploitation. If you have any doubt in that statement, go back and review what happened to the city of Bell. So I hope we won't see that happen again. That's all I got. So. Uh, I'd like to say something before everybody says it. I would appreciate it if the city council would refrain from using words like corruption and I forgot what the phrase was. Collusion. Collusion, and also denigrating the city attorney in public. You know, we we have employees that work here, and we need to respect them. If we have an issue with anybody, then let's do it in private, as it's supposed to be done if they're employees. So the city attorney, by the way, works only for the city council. That's who he works for. It's three people report to the city council. City manager, city treasurer, city attorney. So it's one of our employees. Let's have a little respect for him. Thank you. Okay, and just and the, the reason I brought that up because you were in the meeting when we voted on the, the measure. You that just don't just and you know what we voted on. Uh, and that, you know it, it we did it was not it was not a question, it was not unclear, and it was changed without anybody's other than Marianne's consent. 
Yes. And I think that's wrong. All right. I'm not, not commenting on whether or not uh, that took place. My comment to you is let's be professional in our uh, actions for people. I've always been professional in whatever I try and do. I try and be honest when I, if I've got an opinion, I'm going to state it because that's what I'm supposed to. That's why I got elected. That's what I think I got elected. That's what I said when I was running. Okay, uh, let's move on to the consent calendar. Uh, anybody else? Go ahead, Paul. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the consent calendar in its entirety, unless somebody wants to pull one of them. Thank you, Paul. I would normally have done that myself, but I appreciate your help. Anybody pull anything from you? We don't have any speaker slips. Do we have any raised hands on Zoom? No, we don't have any raised hands on okay, Zoom. Just, we got a motion. You need a second. I'll second. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, moving on. No, uh, the ayes have it. Uh, ordinance 4A, we're going to appeal. We're going to leave to another meeting. And just notice that with 4A, with the reason we're keeping it on the agenda is if there is a lawsuit, the appeal comes back. That's the kind of agreement we signed. Okay. Uh, that's what it says. That's what it says. No. What it says. May I speak? Yeah, please. No, actually, as I understand it, the if there is a lawsuit, the um, appeal remains pending indefinitely unless and until the lawsuit is resolved, in which case the skate park is held up indefinitely. That's the way the agreement works. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, item 6, we, what are we doing, 6B six, now? 6C. Six 6C. Six C. Uh, Senate mm -hmm. bill from uh, Senator Stern. Do we have a staff report? Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Before you, you have a request to authorize the Mayor to send a letter of support uh, for Senate Bill 1509, um, named for the NOT in California Act. Uh, NOT is an acronym for Negligent Operator Treatment. Um, the proposal is to amend existing traffic laws to designate convictions of driving over 26 miles per hour of the posted speed limit or greater um, to a two-point violation against someone's driver's license. And this is one of the pieces of legislation um, we'll highlight a bit in the next agenda item, but we do recommend your support of this. Thank you very much. Any comments? Back to any, any raised hands? There are no raised hands. Well, to the council table. Any comments? Uh, Doug? I'll make the comment. I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve this. I'll also make the observation that this is a great uh, item to have, but you got to catch them first. So I, I'm all in favor of it. And, um, you know, as somebody has uh, said here on the council, if uh, you're going this fast, and you're doing these kind of things, we got to impound your car. And if you go over 100 miles an hour, we should crush it. But I don't think that's going to go through the legislature this year. I'll, I'll second, second the motion. Okay. All in the favor. Anybody else? Paul. Paul? I, I just want to say that I know Doug had talked to Henry Stern about this, and I've talked to Henry Stern about this. It's a great idea. It really gets to the core of what makes it hurt for somebody because you only need four points to lose your license for a very long time. And I'm sure that Sergeant Soderlund and his people are going to work very hard to catch those people who are going 26 miles over the speed limit. Okay. Anybody else? Bruce? I, I think this is a great idea and it's a no-brainer to support okay. it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? The ayes have it. Moving down to 6D. Uh, yes, so keeping with the, the theme of uh, PCH, if you will, um, tonight for item 6D, it's our intention to provide an update on the special projects and initiatives that were presented to the City Council back on January 22nd. Uh, the City continues to focus on four key areas and objectives set forth on November 14th uh, by City Manager McClary during the special meeting of the PCH Task Force. Um, those areas are a commitment to collaboration with our, our state partners such as Department of Transportation, OTS and Caltrans, increased law enforcement presence in Malibu, support of state initiatives through introduction of legislation um, or funding opportunities, and lastly, public education campaigns. Staff has also reviewed the list of 16 traffic calming measures that were proposed at the 22nd uh, or the meeting on the 22nd. Um, and before I get into that analysis of those measures, uh, there are some highlights in the latest report that we wanted to bring to your attention. Um, 
those are in the area of enforcement. Uh, you may have seen that uh, as of January 1st, the CHP, California Highway Patrol Task Force, uh, that is a three officer task force, has issued 470 citations, 408 of which were for speeding. The remaining 62 uh, were for primary collision factors such as reckless driving or distracted driving. In the packet for tonight, um, in the agenda report, you did see uh, traffic collision data um, from 2013 to 2023. Um, I would like to thank the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department for putting that together for us. Um, I would like to draw the council's attention, and I'll, I'll put it up on the slide here, um, to page four, uh, which is the attachment, um, and it's the collision heat map. Uh, it's important because as we get into some of the analysis of the traffic calming measures, this is gonna kind of serve as a guide here. Um, I'm ask. We're having a little bit of, of technical difficulties, so we'll be doing this manually, uh, but that's gonna be coming up here. Um, so with the uh, heat map that you're about to see, um, some of the proposed measures that will go through, the concentration of the collision data um, that you can see here, I realize that it's a bit of small print, but it is from um, John Tyler uh, there at the, the Pepperdine turn signal all the way up to Topanga. Now, obviously there's other areas interspersed with that that you can see, um, but this is really gonna focus on, on some of what we'll bring to you here. <clears throat> Some of the legislative initiatives, as mentioned by City Manager McCleary, uh, at the state level um, is that SB 1297 has been introduced by Senator Allen to uh, amend and extend the safety camera pilot program to include Malibu. Um, also, SB 1509, which you just took action on, is proposed by Senator Stern. Uh, we do believe that these are uh, great measures that do support the safety measures that we're trying to implement here in Malibu. Both of these bills have a hearing date in front of the Transportation Committee of April 9th. Um, also in the report, we do have a summary of the redesign of PCH. Um, regarding the redesign on January 25th, uh, District 7 Director uh, Caltran for Caltrans, Gloria Roberts, did announce during uh, her presentation of the update of the director's order uh, to the California Transportation Commission that Caltrans has undertaken a study for the redesign of PCH. Um, this study is focused on the stretch of McClure Tunnel uh, to Ventura County. Uh, the timeline for the completion of the study is December of 2024. Why this is important, or we wanted to bring that to your attention, is because part of this study is to evaluate the effectiveness of those remaining infrastructure improvements proposed in the 2015 safety report. Um, obviously, some of those have uh, been analyzed by our own city staff, uh, but we do want to make sure that we are dedicating resources appropriately to infrastructure improvements. Um, so we're looking forward to making sure that some of those remaining projects that have not been either identified by Caltrans or that we are still waiting on funding sources, that those are the appropriate measures to put in place moving forward with the redesign concept that we're looking at. And just to reiterate, that's more of the boulevard slowing down traffic, um, making that Malibu's main street. Um, but extending it all the way to our, our neighboring jurisdictions. So with that, we wanted to get into the analysis of the proposed traffic calming measures. Um, I do want to preface that by saying some of those proposed um, that we've gone through that are for recommending temporary or permanent infrastructure improvements um, they do have to meet the design standards that are outlined in the California Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, I say that because there's a few acronyms throughout the analysis uh, that CAMUTCD. I'm going to refer to it for this presentation as the manual. So that's, that's what that is meaning, is that it is subject to those design standards moving forward. Um, as I go through this, myself or a public works director, Rob DeBow, we're happy to provide additional detail. I'm going to go through these and hopefully highlight some of the areas. Um, the proposed measure in terms of imposing a curfew um, uh, with specified exemptions, we do have some additional questions, but in, those are revolving around enforcement. 
as to how would the city enforce something like this. Um, we would need to do a study of the effectiveness of these safety measures. Um, how would the uh, city prevent others from removing, such as Caltrans, but removing those emergency speed limit stop signs, conflicting or confused motorists. Um, we also did look at some studies that talk about the Christmas tree or Christmas light effect um, that actually more signs and things can create, uh, basically you ignore those signs and, and measures that are put in front of you and it can actually lead to some some additional behaviors that we would need to potentially correct. But um, so that does apply to some of the areas where we get around into the enforcement aspect of that. Um, placement of multiple electronic signs uh, throughout the city. Um, so the changeable message sign boards, uh, we are in the process, the city has began to replace our changeable message sign boards. Uh, we have also collaborated with Caltrans and OTS um, that they are bringing in additional changeable mes message sign boards to place at the freeway entrances of, for example, the 101 and uh, as you come into the canyons or on the 10 as you come onto PCH there where it turns into the one at McClure Tunnel. Uh, what these message sign boards are saying is enforcement increased along PCH. Um, they are, you know, drive slow. Some of the messaging there uh, that we are looking to um, communicate to motorists as they come into that area, uh, some of those have been deployed, uh, but we're expecting more to be in that area. Um, also, radar feedback signs. Uh, there are um, an additional 13 being installed. Um, so those are within the parameters of the director's order that were identified. Now those are being installed regionally, um, but we can expect to see those as we understand most of those um, measures or infrastructure improvements, uh, they've been mobilized and they're just waiting on those items to arrive within the area for Caltrans to begin the work. So you'll start to see that work in conjunction with our traffic signal synchronization project. Placement of additional decoy vehicles. Um, we, at the time that we looked at this, we were down to one decoy vehicle. Um, I know that our uh, partners in the Sheriff's Department were looking to acquire and place back some of the additional decoy vehicles. Um, so those are kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. We know that it also only works as much as you use it. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're moving the placement of those on a regular basis uh, to deter and use as, as traffic decoys. Again, the um, erecting flashing red, yellow lights, temporary stop signs, that does fall again to the manual and those design standards and those timelines. Um, the creation or of uh, temporary pedestrian crosswalks, um, again, within the design manual, what we have looked at, uh, the city is currently evaluating the installation of one new pedestrian crosswalk on PCH, specifically Carbon Canyon Road. Um, but in addition to that, the city has initiated discussions with SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments. Um, they have what's called a Go Human campaign, and it's a kit of parts. Um, within that, they have temporary infrastructure that you can install as pilot programs. Uh, what we're looking to do there, and this will get into where, when we talk a little bit about the safety zones and residential zones and things like that. Um, but in that heavily concentrated area identified from John Tyler to Topanga, but specifically in the area of Civic Center Way to Big Rock, uh, we will be looking to launch the kit of parts. Um, that would be for a period of one week each month to collect data. Within the kit of parts, it installs a curb extension, crosswalk, and it's called a pedestrian refuge island. Um, and so in the areas identified in the safety study and where we can work with Caltrans to implement those things, we will be looking to install those measures and see if those are feasible. Those will align with the transportation uh, stops, the public transportation stops, as well as some of the identified public access ways to beaches that we know are heavily trafficked within that corridor as well. So we want to be able to see if that's a feasible location for those infrastructure improvements that would allow us to put some, some dollar signs to those as well. Place, uh, the placement of temporary and removable speed bumps. 
Um, again, getting into, I hate to sound like a broken record, but the manual, um, but speed bumps are not recommended for safety concerns for anything over 30 miles an hour. So over 30 miles per hour, they become launch pads is the way I would characterize it. Can I ask a question? Um, just, yeah. Is this information you're providing now about the speed bumps, the signs, the crosswalks, is that in the written material? I, I read this, but I don't remember seeing any of this. It, some of it was in the, suppl the supplemental report uh, that was provided um, in terms of the evaluation of those things. Uh, what I'm referring to is back on the 22nd, the list. I know. I'm, I'm yeah. asking is, do, does the written material include discussion of the thing, the things I just identified that you've been talking about? Speed bumps, crosswalks, and signs and signals. These are my specific comments that I prepared for tonight, so no. So I didn't, I didn't just miss them. They're not in the written material. Okay. No, I, I apologize. Because sure. I, I, I could, I read this and I don't remember hearing, seeing any of that. Understood. My Thank apologies. You. I'll make these available to the council. Um, so, so speed bumps, as I mentioned, um, and then uh, restricting the right of vehicle operators uh, to drive in excess of the posted speed limits. This is um, where we do get back into the enforcement discussion. If we were to post speed limits outside of a study done in the standards within the manual, we would run into issues of it could be challenged in court, it could be thrown out. So. Those are some of the areas that, that we you know, would need further discussion and direction on. Um, and that also, that same falls into um, restricting the right of vehicle operators uh, to drive without stopping and speci at specified emergency stoplights and to declare the driving in excess of, of specified speeds, um, that it's not reasonable or prudent on specified stretches of, of PCH. Um, in the regards into the request of the DUI checkpoints, um, the city is working with our law enforcement partners to perform those. Um, we did, as we mentioned on the 22nd, uh, submit a grant. We're not waiting for the grant. The grant would rather be an enhancement uh, to such things, but we are moving forward and going to be conducting those uh, within the, the city. So definitely be looking for, for more information on that. Um, the narrowing and uh, width of lanes due to, to K rails or collapsible, collapsible lane separations um, in specific areas highlighted uh, or the closure of lanes from time to time, um, leaving one lane for, for traffic flowing, those still again would fall into the, the Caltrans manual that we would need to, to do so. So unless those specific construction or emergency um, requirements in terms of rock slides things of that nature, um, that would limit us in, 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 to deploy those, those mechanisms. Um, okay, uh, the um, closure of the center turn lane um, to prohibit U-turns and certain um, illegal turns along PCH, um, we did uh, look at temporary medians. I'm going to defer to our public works director for that one. I think you've heard me talk for long enough. So good evening. Uh, uh, so this item where we've been looking into different options that we can do to implement, to do some temporary medians, to, to actually reduce the width of the median and actually uh, narrow the lanes, squeeze everything in, and and gain a substantial more room on the shoulder and area so people can actually use that area. They can see turning in and out of driveways. That's a, that, that was a big thing that we um, noticed out there with Caltrans. Uh, uh, the residents have really have, to have a hard time turning out of their properties with drive driveways, looking at traffic. So having, having more space between the travel lanes and the driveway and having wider shoulder areas kind of gives the drivers a, a little bit more room to see and inch out and kind of see and make a safe safe turn into traffic. So um, so our our design team for Signal Sync has been developing a concept to where we have these um, temporary, I guess they're kind of uh, rubberized curb curbing that we can put in the median um, 
on either side so we can form a solid median. We can actually fill in between there with, with some temporary asphalt and, and make it a median. Um, if, if that doesn't, if we need to move it or change it, it's an easy thing that can be pulled out and moved and, and adjusted. Uh, uh, one other thing that we're looking into is making sure if we do this temporary median or we do this area uh, where we have a median within there and remove the two-way left turn, make sure we have sufficient areas to where the public and residents have a safe opportunity to make U-turns to go into either from one side of PCH to the other. Because essentially, once you have a temporary median on PCH, you're limiting others from actually making that, making that uh, I guess, U-turn or, or left turn crossing crossing PCH and, and, and get into their home or their businesses. And so having an effective way to actually do that in a safe way uh, would be to having dedicated uh, turn lanes, U-turn areas where you have signals. Um, this movement where you have um, U-turns or left turns in center medians has been identified in, in the 2015 PCH safety study it is a major um, safety safety movement that causes great concern and causes a, a lot of accidents on PCH. So, so we've been developing this kind of standard. We've been kind of talking with Caltrans. There is an opportunity to potentially do some, do do one of these um, pilot programs. Um, I think we were looking right in front of potentially the. Um, I think it was the pier, maybe potentially to, to do a temporary one. But we're I, I'm working closely with Caltrans and seeing if they have some remaining funds to actually do this quickly. If if they decide not to, I'll, we can we can report back to council and get further direction to see if council is interested in doing a pilot program like this. But um, Caltrans was was really interested in volunteer to see how they can implement this faster. So that's something that we were looking into. Um, I think it'll make a big difference on, on visibility on PCH. You know, as mentioning, PCH is a very wide and long corridor, and that, that gives the impressions for drivers to feel safe driving faster. If it's a narrower corridor, shorter segments, um, that, that tends to lead to drivers to drive, drive slower. And so this is a a traffic calming measure that can, that's that's been known to actually have improvements on people driving slower. So I think that's enough for that one, right? Okay, sorry. I, I promise I only have a, a couple more here and I'll, I'll make them as short as possible, but um, the elimination of parking on certain stretches of PCH, we can say Caltrans is in review of the width of certain stretches of the shoulder um, to determine if those areas do not meet the 13 foot width. Um, so those could be made to be no parking zones, but that's currently part of the study that they are the, the safety study or the safety audit rather that Caltrans is conducting in those areas um, and the city's in review of those to determine opportunities for public access and, and alternates for parking, because we do want to identify where those would be in the event that that determination is made. So working in collaboration with that. Um, creation of um, one or more interim safety corridors. Um, in that, um, we do have to work within the confines of the current vehicle, California Vehicle Code and State Highway Code. Um, so because there is not a determination of an interim safety corridor, um, in the analysis we've we've looked at, and I say we meaning on Rob and uh, uh, Mr. DeBeau and his folks, um, that in the state code it does define the um, parameters or the thresholds that we would have to meet in certain areas um, for a, a business district as well as a residential district. Um, and to refer back to the heat map that you saw earlier, this is again in that same concentration that uh, Rob alluded to for where we're considering the temporary um, slash permanent <laughs> medians. Um, but for the business district, you must have no less than 50%, and this was part of that analysis that went out in the supplemental, no less than 50% of that use on one side of the highway um, 
within that certain length of the highway. Um, early determination has, we've seen that we have 55% of that use along that. In addition, on the residential district side, um, the state code refers to thir 13 homes, no less than 13 homes every quarter mile. And so between those two, we are proposing and have to, to Caltrans that from, from Civic Center where a little bit um, east, west of that, um, and I'll defer to Rob to give you the exact area, but that they consider outlining both of those districts in that specific. Does that conclude your report or? No. Yes, <laughs> we'll stand for any questions. Any questions? Yeah, I've, I've got a few questions and comments. Um, comments are after public. Oh, we got a public. Oh, that's right. We can ask questions. Though. Yeah. Any, 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 I, I don't have any speakers lips, anybody online. There are two raised hands. First is Alex. Alex. Hey, thank you. Uh, my name is Alex Cruz and I'm returning again to talk about traffic safety because I came to speak about it over a year ago before the big crash that occurred in October. Uh, I want to seriously just express that the enforcement is a waste of money. Police are not going to solve this issue and we need to focus more on redesigning the streets. I'm absolutely tired of hearing over and over again the, the focus on speed cameras, speed back signs, and the cops. These things cannot keep a crash from happening. Even after the camera, the, if a speeder crashes, it's too late. Someone already lost their life. We need to take preventative measures. I asked over a year ago to work with Caltrans about redesigning PCH, and it has taken way too long. You guys waited for more lives to be lost and a serious crash to happen to take action. What about all the crashes that haven't been reported and all the really close calls that are just as important? You never considered those. What you guys told me was you couldn't do anything because that's Caltrans, but look what you're doing now. Now you're collaborating with them which is what I asked for. And I specifically even said you should do it before another death. I hate to say this, but I told you so. I warned you. And if we're going to redesign PCH, one of the lanes must absolutely be changed into a bus lane only. If, if not, you guys do not care about the traffic. You guys don't really want to slow cars down and you don't care about public safety. It must be a bus lane. I don't want to hear that you cannot do anything because it's Caltrans. You guys work with them. Why would the crosswalks be temporary? That's very ridiculous. I just know one day Malibu will be safe from this car-centric design the way it's supposed to be, and people will look back thinking how ridiculous it was that you allowed this to continue for so long. Stop catering to the deadly auto industry. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Who's next? Joe Drummond. Joe, you're up. Hi again. Um, I hear Alex. That's it, it really did take this tragedy to get Caltrans to act. And I do want to really thank Alexis and Rob Dubow for this amazing presentation and this plan to get these medians and these lanes narrowed so that people will actually slow down. And this is exactly what Bruce Silverstein was, was asking um, right after the tragedy to have this done. So I'm glad it's getting done and I hope it will get done. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Anybody else? Those are all the raised hands. Okay. I'll close public comment, bring it back up to the council table. Any comments? Yeah. Um... So questions and uh, maybe comments. Uh, not that I'm encouraging anybody to count more people that have passed away on uh, PCH, but I don't think our statistics, and I've said this before, actually encompass all the people that have been killed because it doesn't seem to count the pedestrians. Um, it's traffic collisions, but the pedestrians aren't, aren't on the count as well, which is even more tragic. Um, the question, you were talking about the manual, and I understand Caltrans came out with a new manual. Uh, are we, 
I would just want to get confirmation we're using the new manual now, right? Okay, I'm getting the heads nodding yes for those that uh, don't hear that. Yes, Caltrans did issue revision eight, so our analysis is, is being conducted with, evaluated with that. Okay, uh, I just want to pass along also uh, something I saw this morning. It was up at Big Sur, uh, Caltrans District, District 5, on their own, is lowering the speed limit from 55 to 45 in the Big Sur area in order to comply with the uh, Caltrans director order number, I think it's, I lost my notes here, I can't find them, number 36, which says that they're going to have a zero, they're shooting toward a zero fatality, I believe in 2050. And they appear to do it on their own. I don't know what their authority is because we always talk about the uh, speed trap law, but we ought to find out how they did it in District 5, and we're down here in District 7. Um, and Big Sur, I've driven that road, If I, I could understand why they want to lower the speed limit. Um, on the uh, median work done, I noticed this the other day when I was coming back uh, from uh, Santa Monica. There was a traffic accident, traffic problem, and the fire trucks and the police and all the emergency responders were using the median. If we, not that I'm advocating not to do it, but how do we solve that problem for emergency responders? So, so yes, we're, we, we are going to be communicating with uh, the fire department and the sheriff's department to figure out, make sure we have an optimal kind of uh, plan for any medium to go into there and make sure that they get buy-in and they have, they provide us information and um, ability to kind of maneuver through that area safely. That's, that's one of the major concerns too that we're looking into and making sure that we have something in place for that. Yeah, and I figured the traffic synchronization may allow you to go from side of one side of the street to the other perhaps, but uh, it, it does seem to be an emergency route that had this intermediate. Um, I won't go through all the uh, parts of your presentation, especially the, the comments about the 2015 study, but I was probably more taken back as I looked at the 2015 study, the current status report, where it says in design, in design. It kept, it kept talking about the things that aren't being done, they're in design or to be designed. Um, I know you've made the comment about the December uh, analysis. I, I'm assuming that that December analysis will address the ones to be designed or still needs to be reviewed. And I know I made the comment a couple of months ago, before we get too locked into 2015, we need to make sure it's still current. It's been nine years. And I'm assuming that's what you're gonna do in December. Um, I know you can't sit there and itemize which ones they're going to look at harder or not, but a phrase I've used oftentimes is a problem postpones a problem solved. And that's not the case here. And just uh, delaying this till December is just another eight or nine more months. And anything, we need to need to have some kind of a reporting mechanism that says this is what we're going to be designing or this is not being designed. Um, I'm content right now to say you want to take a hard look at it, but I'm thinking that by September or so, you kind of know which ones you're looking at to design or which ones you're not. So. Robert, is there anything you do about that? Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. Um, um, the city and Caltrans and the Sheriff's Department have been working collaboratively um, doing road safety audits on PCH. There's two separate ones that we were conducting. The first one was from roughly Cross Creek to the city limits or just past Los, uh, yeah, about to city limits. Um, that report ha has been drafted up, we're looking at it, and we're going to review it. And they're trying to finalize that report, but, but essentially that's looking at that whole corridor, identifying safety measures that Cal Caltrans can implement to make PCH safer. A, a lot of those elements or recommendations that were in the 2015 safety study recommendations will also be evaluated with the study to try to incorporate as, as many as those and furthermore safety improvements that can be done within that section. Um, shortly, I think it was probably a couple months ago, two, three months ago, we performed another safety audit and that was from Cross Creek going all the way west towards the city limits. So there's two separate road safety audits that were, that were being conducted. Um, currently right now, Caltrans is wrapping up that section, the westerly one, 
um, in, in the hopes of the same thing. Look at improvements or opportunities to improve safety on PCH, incorporate as many of those 2015 PCH safety study recommendations into that report, and basically do a big project. They have two big projects slated on, on PCH. They are, they're, they're called um, major capital or major uh, maintenance projects. And one of them is from McClure Tunnel to, to Cross Creek, and the, other, and the other one's from Cross Creek to um, Ventura County Line. So what they're trying to do is uh, um, wrap up the, the one from Cross Creek to Ventura County Line this year. And that, and that includes wrapping up the 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 road safety audit, looking at all, all the measures that they can implement into their into that section, do that project. They want to get that out probably this fall, and, and be and be done with that project. Um, I'm expecting a list or a scope of work of what they're going to be doing with that project sometime this summer. And, and then we'll have a better idea of what, what they're planning to do with that project. Same thing is happening with the other site from McClure Tunnel to, to Cross Creek. Caltrans is doing a major project. They're going to implement all as many of those safety improvement projects with the, this project from the road safety audit and PCH safety study. They're going to develop the same scope, get that to us so we can present and kind of make sure Everybody knows what they're planning on doing with that major project when that section there. That project is slated for farther down the road. Um, they are developing schedules on when that project will be completed. It's, it's definitely farther out than the previous one I mentioned, the one from Cross Creek to the Western City Limits. So I'll, I'll have no more information. They're, they're actively working on that. Um, I have weekly meetings with them, getting updates on both projects and where they are. Um, so as soon as we get more information on, on, on where they are on that project, I, I will uh, be able to probably provide more information. But they are. This is this is very encouraging to seeing that how fast they they are moving on some of these projects. Uh, um, this is something that I, that, I, that I haven't seen them move this fast in my career here at the city. So. Um, so it, it's really encouraging and it's kind of, it's, it's exciting and seeing that they're stepping up and, and, and doing, doing these improvements and they, you know, they see the, the need to do these, um, you know, I'm seeing action. It, it, it's, 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 it's a good feeling. It's, it's a good partnership as it is right now. Uh, and I agree with you. I, from my time on public safety, they look like a, a more of a dead operation. They didn't move at all. Now they seem to be moving to, to rapid speed. But I, I want to, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. Let me kind of go over it very quickly. I think you're absolutely right. And we can't lose sight of the fact that there are really two parts to uh, PCH from Malibu. We've got the part that's on the heat map that shows a lot of accidents. Speed limit is 45 there right now. And that's the first half. And then you get to the other half from Cross Creek to uh, city limits to the west or Ventura County. And if we're not careful, we're going to turn that into a racetrack because you're going to have all the traffic held back on one side and wide open, four lanes, five lanes headed out to the west. So we've got to be cognizant of that in your reports and studies. We've got to, got to make sure we balance this a little bit. Um, in reading the report, it talked about uh, Caltrans M, Measure M, or not Measure M, but uh, uh, project M kept referring to that. I know we have our uh, capital improvement plan. What is it this M project for? So that's that's the project I was mentioning on the other side. That's their major that's a, major one. They call it their Cap M. Okay, Cap and M program. I, I was trying to be kind of, I, I didn't want to use a lot of acronyms in Caltrans. They have a, a ton of acronyms. They'll make your mind spin. So I was just trying to make it a little bit easier for us to understand. Well, if you're a professional engineer and you go by PE, it starts there, so I won't go any further. Um, in, in looking at uh, the solutions that you have on the supplementary report, you know, it's very clear that 
legality and restrictions and manuals are going to preclude us doing most of the things that are in there. But there are some, there's one aspect that seems to be a common thread of success, and that is the safe corridors, the business corridors, and so forth. We talked about it in public uh, uh, session a couple of times ago about you bringing in a consultant to make this turnkey ready, the application for the safe corridors and so forth. Where are we with, with uh, Caltrans on that, and what do we need to do to get that done? Because as I'm reading this report, and what I know from our conversations even with uh, Calstrat this morning, for two of us that were in that meeting, you've got speed limit control, you've got potential uh, restrictions on everything from traffic calming measures are lifted, and you've also got higher fines. I mean, this seems to be uh, a ticket to success if we can get it done quickly. So, yes, the, the the two items that we're actively working on and close to kind of seeing how we can implement it are the business district and the residential district. Um, the business district we are looking at from roughly to where the pier is to carbon. So that would be designated as a business district. Uh, um, I conducted all the research and counted all the, the properties on one side and come to the conclusion that there's 55% of the businesses on, on the on the land side of a PCH between that section are businesses. And so looking at the code with that section, it, it appears that that section that can qualify for for a business district. So the next step is to kind of collaborate with, with Caltrans, which I, I am plan, planning on doing uh, potentially this week on kind of seeing there was a next step to kind of seeing how we, how we can get this forward. The other one was the residential district and we're looking from carbon all the way to the city limits to the east and to, yeah, to the east and to um, just as, just as Alexis mentioned there is a statutory requirement to how that is designated. It's 13 thir what thir 13 residential homes within a quarter mile. And so, and, and that's all on one side. So, yeah. Both sides. So. What, what, I, thought, I read it to be both sides. It's, you, you, count, you count all the homes on both sides of the highway, and if there's 13, you've, you've got the number. It's not a divided highway. It's pretty clear that we make that density so it, it, in that whole area, yeah, so, even on one side. So either one side or the other, so one side or the other, it, it, it makes it, it, it qualifies for for that district too. And so uh, once again, we're gonna be looking at Caltrans and, and pushing this to, to go forward because it, it from, our, from our standpoint, that section does qualify for as a residential district. And then that gives us the ability to, to lower speed limits. Okay. Uh, I've, Two quick other observations. I think when you get your safety audits done, it might be helpful for us to know how this uh, compares or adds to the 2015 study. And what I'm thinking is you may want to start reporting to us as, you know, here's item number 101 in the 15 study is now to be found in the safety audit and is being addressed somewhere else. And just, just help us make sure we're getting these things checked off and just track them. And I'll leave it up to Alexis, who seems to be superb at tracking projects. Um, I, I, this has been a real eye-opener the last few months to see our tracking system, so thank you very much for that. Um, and then with that, I'll leave it to uh, other people to make comments. Well, yeah, uh, thank you for mentioning the design uh, manual you're doing using. I, I have recently, in the last month, obtained a copy of a design information bulletin number 94 that was issued January the 16th of 2024. And it is very friendly to designs for PCA, for highways that are friendly to the neighborhoods and the business districts. Have you seen a copy of that yet? Yes, is, is the short answer. We were provided that um, by one of our, our local um, residents that, that provided that to us. Okay, so that's good. 82 pages and a lot of good ideas. Thank you. 
Bruce? I'm going to I'm going to ramble all over the place, but I just want to start with um, the residence district and the business district. Um, I'm 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 actually pleasantly surprised to hear we have a, that we qualify for business districts. I thought it was a no-brainer that we have residence districts. I've been saying this for the past couple months. Why do we have to go through a process to ask them to confirm that one plus one equals two? The statute doesn't say that they get the discretion to determine whether there's a district. It says there is. It's a residence district if, and, and we have the if. So, I mean, I, it's great that they're, that they're moving faster, but actions speak louder than words. Why are we not just getting residence districts immediately? Because they've been there for the past decade. So, so the plan is that, to try to collaborate and work with Caltrans on this. Tell them the, the data. Tell them the code. Tell them everything that what it is. And um, I, I, I'm sure we're going to be able to work something out and, and get that going. I, I think it's just working as a collaborative group to get there. I, I think we'll be able to get there. I'm, you know. My, my first action, my, my first recommendation is to try that approach first, okay. see if that works. So, so because if it doesn't work, then then yeah, it, it's the next step in saying no. It's this, based on this code, and, and we're ready to move forward with this. Okay, so, right. Okay. So I mean, I'm I'm not suggesting today that we be bringing litigation or anything like that. But I mean, I I would think that it's a matter of educating them that. This is not something, this isn't like a speed where you have to do an engineering study and there's there's subjectivity built into it. There's a statute that's crystal clear and we we clearly satisfy it. Yep. You just need to walk down the road and count the driveways and we satisfy it. And it, it's a sin that they haven't acknowledged it for the past decade. Who knows how many lives could have been saved already in those residence districts, which is half the city pretty much. Yep. So that's, yeah, that's my approach is to walk it through them, show them everything, and then, you know, see where this goes. But definitely, I, I you know, agree with you. We have the statutes and everything, in, like, in our favor that we can move forward to. it. I just, you know, working collaboratively with Caltrans at this point is is, is something that I think will be beneficial. Yeah. So, uh, all right, so I, I'm going to find this all over. First of all, I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat um, optimistic from hearing the report today. I wasn't when I read the report, because when I read the report, it looked like there was a lot of public relations repeating the things we had been told in the past about long-term projects, which may or may not ever occur, and legislation which may or may not ever see the light of day. And then there was this analysis of things, of, of traffic calming measures, but there were only like seven or eight of them analyzed, and they were pretty much all negative, although I think the actual facts are more positive than what was in here. But I'm hearing more things, which is which is good. And in fact, I was I was disappointed when I read the report not to see those other things discussed because I knew they were part of the mandate to to have us to talk about them tonight. Um, there are others, by the way. Residents have recommended some, have proposed some things, and um, our motion also very clearly was the staff should come up with others. And, and, and Rob, I mean, I think I commend you for the um, medians because I think that's a new one, but. You know, you, you got to throw out 50 ideas to get one that works. And some people think it's a waste of time to talk about the 49 that don't work, but it's by talking about the 50 that may work that you get the one or the two that do. And, you know, let's, let's come up with 500, and maybe we'll get 10 that work. Um, so I, I'm hearing some good things. But again, you know, talk is cheap and action speak louder than words. And so far, there's not been a lot of action. There's, there's, there's a lot of talk, and maybe the talk is speeding up. And I'm really pleased to hear that, it's, that, the, that the consideration is accelerated, more, more so, at Rob, as you said, than you've seen before. And I actually think, I, I, I want to say, I, I think we get some credit for that happening, because we need to, you know, the opposite of what we want on PCH, we need to keep our foot on the gas. It's only because we are considering con continuing to hound on this and to press for this and to look at what we can do unilaterally, whether or not Caltrans agrees, that Rob's going to be effective in his diplomacy and his consensus building with um, Caltrans. So, I mean, I hope that we don't just hear the words and sit back and think, okay, things are moving in the right direction. They may be, they may not be, but we need to keep pressing. And if we ends up we keep pressing and, it looks, and the things work and it looks like we're pressing for nothing, 
that's okay. We weren't pressing for nothing. We were pressing for the things that happened. Um, and Rob, I give you credit also for the arrester bed when, you know, when we saw that was a problem two years ago now. Ha of course, ha have there been more um, incidents since that was fixed? I, you know, it, it's funny you say that because I, 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 I drive that way when I come in and every day I look up, look up and see if there's any, you know, if there's tire marks in there. And, and I don't see that many. Every once in a while you see some, but very few. Like the time before we identified the issue, there was, it was almost like once a week or it, yeah. was, it was a lot. But since we did all those, tra all those improvements up in there, it was like it stopped it and, and making that change and identifying with Google Maps in, in ways that they have messed up their 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 direction has kind of really helped. So, yeah. So, but also, I, you know, one other thing, too, that I, that I want to point out, um, some of the things, some of the, the enhancement things that we're doing with PCH Signal Project were, were uh, um, two, two big major ones that we're going to be doing. We're going to be adding red light inf um, enforcement cameras. So we're going to put red light enforcement cameras at those intersections that we know we have we have areas where vehicles are crossing over and, and going through red lights. We have the ability to kind of stop that stop that behavior and, and ticket those with in, in those situations. The other one that I'm really interested in, in kind of making sure this this gets implemented is a speed control um, system that works conjunctually with the uh, signalization system. And what this does is that there there are going to be radar systems cameras out in, in certain locations. They're going to pick up vehicle speeds in a certain area. If a vehicle is speeding over a certain certain a certain limit, it will trigger the the traffic signal, and it will go through the the signal and actually make that upcoming signal red and force those vehicles to stop. So we're going through that analysis to see where we can put that in. Definitely spread it out to where they have enough time to stop rather than having it flash too soon and then they have to run through it and have a red light enforcement camera. But that's going to, that's compounding everything. But that's, those are the two things that I wanted to point out too um, that we're doing on our end to, to try to do that. Okay, and, and I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that we're, we're going to be working on having more DUI checkpoints. I think that'll, that'll be helpful, especially on the weekends. Um, I, just, Again, I'm going to be all over. On page four of the um, supplemental report, um, there was a question that was being addressed. Would a properly performed engineering traffic study justify a prima facie speed limit of 25 or less than uh, something less than 45 or 50? And then the analysis was simply on doubtful that we could get down to 25, but there's, there's, there's a lot of miles between 25 and 45 or 50. So. It, to me, that's like a non sequitur. No, we can't get to 25, but what about getting to 30, getting to 35, getting to 40? That wasn't addressed in here. Uh, and this is along the vein of, you know, again, just we need to look at every every angle, look at it from it, then turn it around, look at, look at it from a different angle, the same question, look at it again, because sometimes the more you look at these things, the more you see. Uh, you want to say something, Alexis? I, I just wanted to, to add to that comment and rather confirm to your statement that our, our intention or recommendation in the analysis that Rob uh, talked through is a continuous 35 miles per hour. That is the recommendation for the speed limit. Okay, that's great. The heat map, um, could you put that back up? It's, it, it's easy when looking at it. I mean, you know, the focus was on eastern Malibu, and that's because the red is prolonged on that side, and it's easy to look at it and think, oh, that's the most dangerous area, but red is dead, and there is red in other areas. So just be, I mean, so eastern Malibu, a lot of red, a lot of accidents, a lot of fatalities, but that doesn't mean that they're not in the other red areas, even if it's just only for a block or two, Red is dead. It's the same. It's the same. Same danger, no matter how large or small it is. It's just a question of whether it's a large or small area you need to do something different in. So I don't want to lose track of the danger in Central Malibu and Western Malibu just because there's a larger dangerous area in Eastern Malibu. Um, eliminate the parking. Um, I'm glad to hear Caltrans is reviewing whether the 
um, shoulders, if I heard, have to be a certain width, and if they're not, the parking really is not justifiable. Um, are we looking at it to show them where they should be looking? So that, that's, that was part of the, the, the road safety audit we performed on both sides, walking up and down the coastline, th them taking measurements, and yeah, they have detailed measurements in areas where they can see where they can, that can, that can happen. So do we, do we have areas that have been identified where they don't have appropriate parking, appropriate space for the parking? So we're waiting for that, um, the draft road safety audit to come back to us that, that will identify some of those areas. So they're, they are working on that report right now. Right, but I'm just asking, do you, I mean, you, you also have oh. done it. Do we, do we know that there are spaces where- Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you know about what percentage of the um, roadway is improperly designated for parking? On the west end or the east end? So, 21 miles, or so, 27 miles, depending on who you ask. So I, I'm gonna separate it in the west and east from, from Cross Creek going west and Cross Creek east. That one's going east. Um, going west, there is less opportunities or like less, less places where the shoulder width is less than 13. It's within that stretch, there, there are big sections where the, the, sh the shoulder is actually very wide. Um, and it's actually very nice for cyclists like myself and others that kind of go in that area. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, section, the east side, there is a, a lot of sections that are less than 13. And so looking at different opportunities, looking at what things to do to kind of el eliminate some of those parking areas to where uh, potentially actually narrowing the, sh the, uh, the median and doing that. If you do that, then you'll have enough room on, on the shoulder to have to accommodate parking and a uh, bike facility in that area. Does, does it have to be 13 feet of paved roadway f for the shoulder? I, from, from our, yeah, yes, I believe so. I, 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 I believe so. Okay, and is there any law that would give us the ability to, re, to restrict parking within a certain distance of driveways? Yes, so, Caltr yeah, Caltrans has, has a standard and has, has a requirement for restriction of the, for driveways. Is that being complied with? Because, you know, there's large stretches in East Malibu where there's driveways every 50 to, to well, I don't know what the feet are, but they're, they're pretty close and the cars seem to go right up to the driveways on each side. Yeah, I, I think that was part of the, they were looking to, to see how they can look at that. There are some uh, um, line of sight issues that they would have to look and see how they can accommodate that. Great. Um, I sort of comment on, Doug mentioned the speed trap law, and I talked, I didn't explain this last time. And again, this is in the vein of, we need to be looking at all the angles. Um, the way I read the speed trap statute is um, if you, re you're, you can reduce the speed limit, but you can't enforce tickets that are given through electronic measurement if you do it without, do it to a certain, if, if you decrease the speed limit by, a cer by over a certain amount, and you, you then have to have signs for some specified period of time. Um, there's a search situation where you can't, by electronic speed testing, cite people, or at least effectively cite them, but you can by monitoring them physically. You can, you can follow them, you can, you can stand and watch how long it takes to get from one place to another, and if you catch people using non-electronic means, the speed trap law doesn't apply. So, uh, and, you know, if you think about it, speed traps, you're driving along, there's no sign of law enforcement, and then you end up getting a ticket because you were caught by radar. But um, the speed trap law is not, a, is, not, is not a prohibition against lowering the speed. It only limits the ways in which you can enforce the lower speed. And again, you know, these little subtleties matter when it comes to what can we do and what can't we do. The Caltrans manual that is cited um, I identified before, and I didn't see this discussed, but um, we are, the city, the local jurisdiction is allowed to control signals, certain signals, certain signs. So we have the right by ordinance to adopt, to, to, to mandate what, what signals and signs certain of them can go. Um, we're limited by the manual in the sense of what kind of sign it can be. You know, a, a stop sign has to be an octagon. It has to be red. It has to have the word stop in the middle. 
but the uh, manual doesn't designate where a stop sign can go. It only designates what a stop sign is. We as a local jurisdiction have the authority statutorily to designate where these signals and signs go. So um, again, it's a subtle difference, but we're, we're only bound by the nature of the signals and signs, not by what the signals and signs, where the signals and signs go. Some statutes say what we can't, that we can't use specific signals, but we have a generic right to signals. And again, there was no analysis of this. And I'm not faulting you for not having it in there, but it, again, we need to be looking at every angle. Um, and the one gentleman that, that commented, Alex, I mean, I, I, I agree. We, it, it's not simply a question of I, the traffic, what are they called, the speed cameras. Doug says it's going to be an uphill battle. I, you know, I doubt that we're ever going to see the speed cameras in Malibu. But I also doubt that they're going to be all that effective if we ever get them. The, the, the key is this boulevard concept. Um, it's, it's a town. It's not, it's not a segment of a highway. And we need to focus not on safety for the traffic, but safety for the people. Um, the road is designed to safely be able to drive on it at high speeds. The road needs to be redesigned to not be able to drive safely at high speeds to require people to drive safely at lower speeds because that's really the issue. And Caltrans historically has been focused on how fast can a car go safely or how fast can a vehicle go safely. And it's nice to see that they're finally recognizing that the safety of the community is more important than how fast can they move traffic through the area. We need to stay on them and make sure that they stay focused on safety of the community, not safety of the vehicles moving through the area. Marianne? Um, thank you to everybody who's participated in this. You've done great work. and. I really appreciate all the effort and the information that you've compiled here. Um, with regards to the speed traps, isn't there a um, lean-in period that you establish the new sign um, at the lower speed and the first 30 days you can't write those tickets or something? Um, and then after that point, I'm not sure. Just so the community gets used to it um, while they're getting used to it being there and at that reduced speed. Okay, well, I thought I read in some of the statutes and some of the manuals that there was um, a time period that that is initiated, and then after that time period, then we can start writing those tickets for that, that time frame. Sounds like maybe Bruce has or Paul. It, it, that's, that's a part of it, but then there's some other restrictions, as, including the, traffic, the engineering study. But again, that only is a, that's only restrictions against writing tickets from electronic means, it's not a restriction against writing tickets from observation. But eventually, it, it will be established that it's at that lower speed, and then we can employ those additional methods. Not unless you have the, the engineering study to back well, it up. Well, I'm going to leave it to staff to maybe weigh in on that. That that is correct in terms of having the engineering study, and then once if it confirms, and the issue that we run up against is the. In terms of the traffic study that would establish the speed, it's the 85th percentile that, that we're running up against with that, with the mode. And I, I know that there's a difference of opinion. I completely understand that. I'm expressing our understanding of that. But um, pending that study, if that study were to establish a lower speed limit, we would be able to then post it. There would be a designated time. This goes into effect before. And, and law enforcement does need that adopted speed study in accordance with the manual in order to write the citations. Right, in addition to the traffic um, accident reports, in addition to the amount of tickets that are written in there. So it's a multi-layer process. It doesn't just, oh, the year in the 85 percentile, so you get this. There are the other residential districts and other things that we can use in order to help reduce that speed. Okay. Um, where's the Coastal Commission on these eliminations of parking places? Uh, we did uh, discuss in our, our meeting, we had a meeting with the executive director as well as our district representative, uh, Mr. Hudson. Um, we did talk about PCH during that. Um, if, if City Manager McCleary would like to, to make any comment um, on that. Uh, but we, we did highlight some of the areas that we understand we need to protect public access and, and look at those. And that's why we, we did mention during our presentation that we're looking at opportunities for alternative 
alternative parking. Uh, we understand that. And so it's really imperative, and we've communicated that with Caltrans, that we are all a part of those discussions of this analysis for the safety audit as well as the redesign. So we are identifying those areas of public access and, and parking along PCH. So um, they are now, my understanding, will be a part of that. Um, we've also sent our task force information over uh, for Coastal Commission to at least be advised of the conversations in that context that we're discussing with them. Um, but they have been advised that these initiatives are moving forward, so we hope to see them in more of an active participation. Yeah, I would include, I would encourage you to, to keep including them because I know there has been pushback after Rob helped me. Wasn't there a parking study? Was that part of the 2015 report? It was a different report. And there was a lot of pushback from Coastal on that when there was talk of elimination of some parking spaces. And so they wanted us to find them somewhere else in the community, et cetera. So, okay. Um, and then, you know, where are we incorporating um, community meetings and community education about these changes that um, I think we probably all agree would be beneficial to our community, but some of our residents may not um, be accepting of them initially, so. Great question. Um, and as part of, I would say, kind of the, the innovation side of what can we talk about, what can we think about, we understand through our public education campaign, whether it's the city initiated or in partnership with, with other agencies, we are ultimately trying to change driver behavior and through the infrastructure, but also the awareness and, and trying to put information out there. Um, the city of Malibu has put together a focus group um, and what that focus group consists of, it's, it's a couple of residents um, that have approached the city with their, their ideas in terms of what we could initiate and do. Um, we've also um, asked our, our law enforcement partners, our participants on that to provide that perspective. And we have also uh, recently included a, um, two students uh, from, from Pepperdine to also collaborate on that to share the perspective of undergraduate and graduate. So you've got commuter and resident in that capacity. So um, because some of those statistics that we're identifying do have that percentage of 20 to 34 year olds that are getting the larger number of speeding tickets. So all that to say is we had our kickoff meeting uh, last week with that that focus group, um, and this isn't this is just one avenue we're taking with public education. But from this point, we are defining what we'll call the scope of work that's coming out of our goals and objectives. And so, in that, we'll have a schedule of community meetings and initiatives, because one of the primary goals is that we want to empower residents. Some of our early outreach, um, whether it be at the 21 mile screening that took place at Santa Monica College or some other avenues obviously here at City Council through public comment, um, we've heard the resignation from, from residents of feeling helpless in terms of doing anything to effectuate change. Um, and so we really want to be able to come up with a campaign that empowers on a grassroots initiative level to put the feeling of being able to come back and come to the table for what the community can do to change behavior on PCH. So um, we've gotten a group of individuals together that are a lot smarter than, than us, <laughs> which is the best way to learn. Um, and so we're, we're excited and we will continue to update council and, and make that public as we define that scope of work. Uh, we are meeting bi-weekly to move those things forward. In addition to that, we're also partnering with OTS, the Office of Traffic Safety and the Department of Transportation. They recently put together a Go Safely on PCH. Um, we're in the... Um, preliminary launch of that and, and going through. That is in partnership also with the city of Santa Monica that we've partnered with and some of the other agencies that we will see um, along billboards, uh, some of the initiatives I talked about and putting changeable message signs along the different entryways into um, Malibu and Santa Monica there and the county areas. So um, those are all ways that we're trying to get that message into our, our commuter, commuters using PCH, the visitors that come um, when the weather's nice on the weekends, like we all saw, and then from there, um, also the residents. 
So um, I think that all sounds great. Thank you. Um, I would make a suggestion on the task force, maybe reach out even to Malibu High School, get those kids early before they develop all the bad habits. Um, and also um, possibly a couple members from Public Safety and Public Works Commission. Uh, so we have a couple more residents in there giving feedback on that. Yes. So, I mean, also what I'm planning on doing is once Caltrans has an idea of, of their scope of work for their big cap M projects is have that, have council, have Caltrans give a presentation to, to a joint meeting, public works and public safety to kind of get, kind of let them know what their, what the project is and have public opportunity to kind of hear and make comments on that. Okay. Um, and then the other uh, aspect, you know, I was thinking some of the comments that I've heard is that slowing down the highway is going to increase my time that it's going to take me to get to Santa Monica. So my feedback to that would be, let's quantify it. How much more time does dropping the speed limit 10 miles an hour actually make on a commute if you're starting from one point or another? Um, just so people see that it really isn't that much time. You have to maybe leave 15 minutes earlier to get someplace. That's probably in most areas of Malibu what it's gonna quantify to. And is that is that 15 minutes that difficult in your life that you can't save a life because of that 15 minutes? Um, so that would just be my feedback on that. And I had one more other thought and I can't think of it along those lines. Thank you again. Um, I know we're going to have more discussions on this, so I'm sure it'll come back to me. Mr. Okay. City Thanks. Manager McClary, did you have? If I could, Mr. Mayor, just add a quick comment. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank our Public Works Director, Rob DeBow, our Deputy City Manager, Alexis Brown, and also the other member of the team that's working on this, our Public Safety Director, Susan Duenas. Um, uh, after this tragedy, I formed a, an internal task force. Uh, we meet every Tuesday to stay up on all the issues. Uh, I continue to be impressed by the creativity and the passion of the group. Um, so uh, I think you've got a good report tonight here, and I know this team is working really hard to try to effectuate some change here. And um, just wanted to, to acknowledge them and, their, and all their hard work on this, and we'll keep plugging away. Hey, thank you. I think, and I, I agree, I think we've made some progress in terms of getting smarter about what we need and and keeping, the, like Bruce said, the pressure on Caltrans. I'm not, we've, we've covered a lot of stuff here tonight. I'm not gonna go back over. Go ahead. I've got a, just a couple more comments. I was, I was waiting to hear yours, but oh, I'll, no more? No, I, no, no, I've, I got a couple. There are, uh, this parking next to driveways. I mean, that seems to be something that they should attack pretty quickly, right? Uh, so I don't know how fast they're moving down that path, but if you can encourage them to Crank that up, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I'll find out more. Okay. Um, I have a call with him on Thursday and I'll kind of get an update. Uh, second thing is this task force that you put together of, of residents and whoever, it might be worthwhile getting the information out there as to who those people are. Because there are other residents who've got ideas who would like to get something in, and you know maybe they can use these people as a conduit if they've got a good idea and they want to get it in front. So, just think about that, you know, because I, I get calls from people a whole bunch of times saying, you know, why aren't we doing this? Well, uh, let them let them get it into the, the meat grinder there and figure out what happens. Uh, the last thing is, and I, you know, and I do appreciate all of the efforts that Caltrans is going through for studies. And but boy, what are we doing this month and next month and to, to get some of that stuff done? And that, that to me is. I thought that's what this was supposed to be. I, th I thought we were going to sit down at one point in time and say, hey, there th what, can we, what can we do, whether it's unilaterally or in somehow connection with Caltrans? I mean, I'm looking at this heat map, and I'm saying, okay, I know that there are areas there where we've got people speeding that are causing accidents. So, and we, we also know that if you narrow the lanes, it slows people down. That's, you know, so, you know, and, and I'm not a traffic expert, but it seems to me I've got these panels I can put up that are easy to get in, I mean, easy to put up. Uh, it seems to me if, if I use those paddles and, and move the, the outside lane in closer to narrow them down, and, and just I mean, target some of these areas where we know we got speeding, seems to me I'd be doing something to slow down the traffic 
to prevent future accidents. Now, maybe Caltrans would, would buy into that, right? I don't, you know, but if somebody doesn't do something, I'd be doing that just to try and narrow those lanes. Let's let and we get we can we can target the areas where we know we got problems. So keep that route with Caltrans. I, I would like to I like to see something done sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, and and whether Caltrans. You know, historically has been slow moving. I think they're moving a little bit faster, but I still don't see, you know, I, I, go, I went through all the list of all the stuff and I try to put dates down. I said when, 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 and I got a lot of stuff that's sitting out there in the future, not much coming in right now. So, Bruce, back to you. Yeah, and to pick up on that last comment, that paddle, I forgot about the paddles. That was on the prior list of things to consider. You know, by Joffrey's, I think it was about a quarter mile, half a mile of paddles, and, you know, we could have a lot more places where that's like that. Um, that's probably even easier than doing a median. Uh, yeah. But I guess that's where that's where there is no median, right? You, you do the paddles where the lanes go against each other, you do the median where there's a turn lane in between. Correct. I, Correct. I, I, I just think that uh, the paddles are good if you already have a, a narrow median already, kind of a situation to where you're, you're really, pro you're prohibiting already a, a double yellow and preventing those left turns going in. Um, Caltrans did put in a big section of the paddles just just uh, west of Heathercliff. Right. There were some there were some sections of PCH down by Heathercliff where mm -hmm. there were some people that were turning left, and so uh, there was a section of paddles that were missing. They filled in that area over there. So those are, uh, paddles are very good for those situations. They're not friendly for maintenance. They constantly get hit and everything else and it's a constant battle of of those getting kind of cleaned up and fixed and replaced uh, the other medians are, are just as good as i mentioned and and just as easy to put down and get to it's it's, it's i think we're close to fi finding a solution to get this thing done and put in um and if caltrans like i mentioned if caltrans isn't able to kind of do that with funding they have from from the director's orders then i'll i will let council know and we will have a plan in place ready to go, and then you guys can make a determination if we want, if the city wants to go ahead and you know move forward with that. So it's it's really close on hearing that from Caltrans if they have the ability to do that. And like I mentioned, the fallback is come back to council and say this is an option for the city to do. All right. So three three closing comments for me. One is to pick up on Marianne's point about slowing down people's commutes. First of all, I agree with everything you said about, you know, it's worth it to save some lives. But people need to also understand the Z traffic issue. We're getting a lot of traffic from people who are going through Malibu because it's faster than going other ways. When they learn that it's not faster to go through Malibu, when Waze tells them it's faster to stay on the 101, then our commutes will actually not be slowed down because it'll just be the people in Malibu driving the speed limit, the lower speed limit. and and steadily going through Malibu through our boulevard as opposed to contending with the people that are skipping the highway and going through Ma speeding through Malibu. So there might be some temporary discomfort. It might even be a year or two, but eventually in the long run, things will slow down and even out. Um, and people need to understand that too. Sometimes you need to sacrifice now to gain later. Um, second point. Um, which I, I neglected to make before, a lot of the analysis of, well, we can't do this because, and we can't do that because, none of that incorporates when there's an emergency declaration. And, and we received some, some privileged information, and we, in fact, we didn't get it till today, so we, we have to digest that. But the emergency declaration statutorily gives us rights that we don't have when there's not an emergency declaration. So as long as we have a legitimate emergency declaration, which I guess we need to discuss, as long as we have a legitimate emergency declaration, all these answers of, well, yeah, but you can't do that because A, B, and C may not be correct because there's no case law that looks at what happens when there's a declaration. Plus, we've got immunity. Last point is, and this goes to the, um, it, it's nice to hear these things, but when are they going to get done? I'm going to ask for consensus that we bring this item back the second meeting of April. So that's three meetings from now. And we learn what's actually been done in six weeks as opposed to what's continuing to be talked about. Um, and we evaluate more possibilities. You know, what else can we be doing? Because the problem has not gone away and the problem doesn't sleep. 
So we need to we need to stay vigilant until until the issue is resolved. So can we get a consensus to bring this back the uh, second meeting of April? I'll, I'll second that. Uh, we're going to keep on top of this. Well, before we pick a date, so let's make sure we know what the staff uh, recommends. They, this is not a small report to put together. Uh, the only issue that we have, sorry, is that the public works director is not going to be here that particular date. So um, we'd like to really like to have him as part of the part of that. How about the next meeting? But but it, I'm not looking. Sure. I'm not looking for this report again. I'm looking for <clears throat> what has happened since this since tonight, and what other things can we be doing that haven't been analyzed yet. Well, I'd ask the city manager or, or somebody, to, what what works for you guys? Because this is a lot to put together. What do you recommend? I, I, I agree with the idea. I just want to make sure it's productive. Well, I, I, I conceptually, I don't have an issue with it. Um, I mean, I agree with all the statements made on the dais in terms of we, we want to stay on this and we need to stay on this. Um, as I, as you noted, it's it's a or as I noted, it's a high priority for staff right now. So. Um, I don't think I think that gives us sufficient time to give an update on 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 what we're looking at here, and then to come back with those other items that you'd ask us to take a look at. First meeting in May. I think we could do that first meeting in May. Yep. Okay. And for the public, you know, even even that's a long time, but at least it's at least we're moving forward. I, I'll make a motion, or I'll second your motion to bring it back. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Yeah, I say it. We're supposed to review and uh, this is a review and file. Review and file item, right? Yeah. Well, it says provide direction to explore and or implement certain measures, but I think we kind we of just did, did that as well. Yeah. Okay, very good. You guys want to take a five minute break? Perfect. How yeah. long is 7A going to be? 7A is short, but it'll go even shorter after, uh, after we've <laughs> all taken a five or seven minute break. Five minutes. Be back at 917. 917. And we only have two other things to do.
Oh, cool. You can see it now. We can, make, we can arrange them in more of a curved situation so we can see each other's hands. Okay, we're ready? Yep. All right. No, we're not on that, right? We're on no, 7A. I, we're on 7A now? 7A. That was uh, the one that Bruce combined it with. And I appreciate that, by okay, the way. Okay, 7A. Let's do 7A. Okay. What we have here, all of us in Malibu were devastated by the tragic death last fall of the four Pepperdine <clears throat> students. Public safety is the number one responsibility of all public officials, and we on the city council consider improved safety on PCH our number one priority, as you've seen tonight. We've been acting on all fronts to provide our citizens with a safer highway. Better awareness through education, speed cameras, enhanced enforcement with the hiring of the highway patrol, and better road design are just a few of the areas we are actively pursuing. I believe that for the first time there is real awareness by the various government entities that the current situation is unacceptable. Let's be real, unless speeders are not only caught but receive adequate punishment, no matter what else we do, it will not be enough to stop the carnage. With the addition of the highway patrol, we're catching far more speeders than ever before, but in a current state law, speeders going over 100 miles an hour or twice the speed limit in a school district do not necessarily lose their license to drive. A person driving under the influence will lose a license, but a person not under the influence but driving over 100 miles an hour doesn't necessarily lose his license. Someone driving an expensive sports car can race across a PCH and if caught, may have his car impounded for a short time. The driver may well not lose his license, will easily pay the fine and drive another car the following day. Enforcement only works when the punishment is significant. Even if we're able to get speed cameras installed in Malibu under the current law, the violator will only receive a small fine and never the loss of a license. It's my sincere hope that we on the City Council will unanimously support the following resolution. And what I'm proposing, what we're proposing here is the language says, whereas the city of Malibu has witnessed the loss of 59 precious lives on Pacific Coast Highway since 2010, and whereas excessive speeding is the leading cause of so many fatalities, therefore the City Council of Malibu hereby petitions Governor Newsom, State Senator Allen, Assemblymember Irwin, County Supervisor Horvath, Sheriff Luna, Secretary of Transportation Omashaken, and Director of Caltrans Tavares, I keep wanting to put an L in there, Tavares, to work collaboratively to make the following changes to the state vehicle code. Anyone who exceeds 100 miles an hour shall lose their license to drive for three months. And anybody who exceeds 100 miles per hour more than once in a 12 month period shall use their license to drive for six months. Also, anyone who exceeds twice the posted speed limit shall lose their license to drive for one month. Anybody who exceeds twice the posted speed limit more than once in a 12 month period shall lose their license to drive for two months. The loss of a license in these instances shall be mandatory, not discretionary. Henry Stern also expressed some interest in this, so uh, Doug and I are proud to propose this. So. Okay. Any comments? I just want to say, you know, if you don't have consequences, no one cares. And the old adage about uh, no one ever commits a crime if they think they're going to get caught. Well, not only do you get caught with this, it impacts your ability to lease a car, right. to rent, to finance a car, to get insurance. It's just like a DUI. You know, we're willing to put these kinds of restrictions on someone with a DUI because they're drunk. But someone that's driving a car at 100 miles an hour is driving a weapon. And we need to put these kinds of restrictions on them. Let's go to public comment. We'll come back with okay. two more. Public comment. Who do we have in there? There are three raised hands. First is Howard Rutsky. Howard, you're on. 
Uh, hi guys. I just like commend Doug and Paul for doing this because if you looked at what happened when the fire was at the 10 freeway and who was standing around Karen Bass, and you looked at who was standing around Karen, um, <clears throat> the mayor of San Francisco when they cleaned up San Francisco, that's the key. Those two guys are the key. And going after them and trying to get them to help with these things, that's how we get Gavin's attention. So I just wanted to commend them and say thank you. Who's next? Joe Drummond. Joe, you're up. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Well, I appreciate you all supporting Senator Stern's additional point violations, as well as this proposal for the suspension of the licenses for excessive speeding. Enforcement is one of the three pillars of road safety. And again, I appreciate Alexis and our public works director, Rob Dubow, handling the engineering aspect in a timely, super timely manner, and they should be encouraged to make these important changes. With this proposal, you might just make the limit 90 miles per hour as the lowest speed limit on PCH is 45 miles per hour, and that is twice the speed. If you're also talking about all Malibu streets, speed school zones are only 25 miles an hour. So I'm not sure the state will mandate license suspension for anyone going 50 miles per hour, even if it's in a school zone, but I hope so. I'm glad that the city has formally requested speed cameras also already. We need to focus our own city resources to get both residents, but mostly young people and non-residents who are committing 90% of the traffic violations to actually drive the existing speed limits. Yes, to slow the pace on PCH. Education is an important part of road safety. And I do know that the city and Alexis and Susan Duenas is working with marketing and brand strategy experts like my husband, Colin, who understand that rewarding good behavior actually has more positive results than punishing bad behavior. Obviously, we need to punish the bad actors and criminals violating our speed limits and endangering our residents and visitors with consequences. But the city needs to go one step further than Council Member Grisanti's suggestions of the yard signs, although I do love the huge one on Fireball Tim's truck, but to start an educational and motivational driving the speed limit campaign that can be successful and remind everyone how beautiful Malibu is and to slow down and smell all the roses we have to offer, like our beautiful scenery and views and to help protect pedestrians and other drivers. You get more response to sugar than salt, so rewarding good driving behavior should also be a priority, whether it be through a gaming element, as Michelle Shane mentioned, or Malibu merch, et cetera. Perhaps Michael, Michelle Shane can also be invited to the marketing of this educational campaign as a consultant if the city is considering sponsoring his safety phone. Police know how to slow down bad drivers, but marketing people know how to harness the psyche of all drivers and promote good driving behavior. I thank you in advance for making this program happen, as this will happen faster than any laws to have the state change. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Anybody else? Uh, the next hand is a call-in user. It could be Ryan Embry. Go ahead. Uh, yes, it's Ryan, and I wanted to say that um, you've identified after-the-fact penalties, which um, would have no effect on the tragedy that occurred um, because the people who drive crazy over 80, 90, 100 miles an hour, they rationalize it in their minds for some bizarre reason, and they do it anyway. So the only way to deal with that is with enforcement, to, to stop the vehicle, arrest the person. So that's, um, it's kind of wishful thinking that we can just load up a bunch of fines and take licenses away later. That doesn't bring anybody back to life. So having said that, the vehicle code 22349A <clears throat> is any speeding over 65 miles per hour. That's a separate code section. And for that, I think we uh, get a, a rider to include Malibu as a special enforcement zone to where there is an added penalty for that. Anything over 65, not double whatever the posted speed limit is. That would get you some enforcement down in the realm of what we're really looking for. 
Um, I agree with the over 100. That's a no-brainer. Um, Joe's identified the, the, the double posted limit. Um, there's going to be a little bit of trouble there when you have a variable speed limit zone where the speed changes because, you know, there's a school down here around the corner or whatever, or if there's a construction zone or, you know, something going on on PCH where they, they post, you know, there's a 15-mile-an-hour posted curb in the middle of Malibu Canyon, if, if anybody's ever noticed. So that's a warning speed. That's not a regulation speed. But I would suggest um, not having it apply to the variable speed zone area, that it would have to be the engineered speed zone or the adopted speed zone for the zone and not um, a variable, which is going to be into the, the double conflict. But I do appreciate your efforts there. And then the other is you need to apply for federal grant for an educational campaign. It's kind of hard to educate anything other than locals unless you got billboards. But the federal um, is a, a resource for proven safety measures, and they have a whole slew of them. And we should be eligible for that based on the fatality rate of Civic Coast Highway. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else? Those are all the raised hands. Okay, thank you. We'll close public comment back up to the council table. Any comments? Bruce? Okay, so first I want to say, you know, in October, Steve and I asked for a meeting to consider proposals for ways we can make things safer in November, and we couldn't get support. In November, we asked for a meeting to discuss proposals. The two of us, we couldn't get support. November, December, we asked for a meeting to discuss proposals. We begrudgingly got support to come back in January and do that. I'm really glad to see that others are finally coming up with ideas and not just um, talking about things. So I, li I like the fact that it's being done. I wish it were done five months ago, not tonight. It's good. This is a long process. Um, so I support this. I, I have two um, drafting suggestions to think about, because I'm not really sure why we're differentiating between 100 miles an hour and twice the speed limit. I would think that the penalty should be the same if you do either. If you, do, you could have one simple thing that says if you either go 100, over 100 miles an hour or twice the speed limit and then have the designated penalties. I also think that there ought to be a loss of a vehicle um, for the second penalty, not just a um, loss of the license. Crush it. Um, I think this thing's going to be a heavy lift legislatively. It may be the equivalent of security feeder, but I don't mind feeder, so let's do feeder. Um, the other thing to think about, you know, and if this ever sees the light of day legislatively, they'll obviously to play with it and change the words completely. But um, the other thing is, I, to make it more palatable, you might want to say in a 55 mile an hour or less zone, these two things happen. Um, because there are places where you can go 75 or 80 miles an hour lawfully. I, I suspect the legislature won't be too keen about having these penalties for people going 20 miles above that. Um, so I would say make it in speed limits of 55 or lower. Anyone who exceeds 100 or double the speed limit gets these two penalties you specify in one. And maybe for the second one, add lose their car or vehicle. So I'd suggest, I, I'll the make penalties, that as a friendly amendment to change it. Yeah, the penalties are different because the posted speed limit one, you know, if somebody's going 70 in a 35, they, they, only, they lose their license for one month. If they're going 100, they're going to lose their license for three months. Yeah, but someone's going 70 in a 35 mile zone is just as dangerous as someone going 100 in a 55 mile an hour zone. Right, or 70 who's going 50 in a school zone is yeah. just as dangerous. Right. So, so just, you know, it, it should be either, either one. If you're doing this or that, here's your penalty. Make it the, more, make it the harsher penalty and add, add losing a car. I mean, like I said, why not? It's just it's a proposal. I would love it if, if Jack Irwin and, and uh, Ben Allen get behind it, and, and they, they, can, they will massage it, I'm sure. But whatever you want to write, we'll write. We just, I want to get something up there to them to show that we're asking for it. I'll make a motion that we send um, asking for support on this to the people listed in the proposal. Nobody wants to tweak the words? It's going to get tweaked as soon yeah, as just, people get their hands on it. 
Hey, let me just, I mean, we have these CAL strategy meetings I'll every, second it. every Monday, right? And if, if I've learned anything from them, as we talk about trying to get speed cameras and those changes in, it's how difficult it's going to be to get some of these things through the legislature. So, you know, if, if you're going to do this, you may want to, I mean, have you guys contacted either Alan or Irwin or, or anybody yet on this thing? Have you had any feedback? To Alan's aware of it, and um, I, I think the, the message that we're trying to send here is just like the speed cameras, I think those were in process for 10 years. This is where we start the process. I don't mean, have a problem. I'm just, you know, to try and move it uh, forward. It's just it's a matter of getting some support up there. Okay. Yeah. We have a motion. We got a motion. We have a second. Yeah, second. The motion is to uh, send a resolution with this language to the uh, individuals listed in the resolution. Individuals, yes. All in favor? Mayor, Aye. if I could just clarify, that resolution will be coming back to the council. I think we'll plan to put that on the consent calendar. We, I don't know that we were ready for it to be adopted tonight, city okay. manager. Well, we don't have a resolution before them. We could send the letter. Um, okay, well, does anyone have the appetite for a friendly amendment to, so to, to revise this so that it's, it's either of these things generates the same penalty? I would go for the harsher penalty and have the second one also generate a uh, forfeiture of the vehicle. All I dug at your motion, so you could answer that. I, I think we're going to have a tough time with the forfeiture, forfeiture of the vehicle, although I would love to see cr cars crushed. And I am aware that there is a municipality that's crushing cars that from car takeovers when they take over the street takeovers. Uh, and I have not been able to figure out how they're doing that and how it's legal, but I think it's a great idea. Okay. Well, well, Paul, my, my thought is if, if you don't put it in there, it's not going to even be thought about. If you put it in there, they can always take it away, but at least, it, and it also gives them something to strike and leave something else. So where would we, where would we add the, uh, the crushing? The second, the second time. The second time you get hit for the same penalty. So you lose your license for six months and we crush your car. No, you forfeit the car. And you forfeit you forfeit your vehicle, just like you forfeit drugs when you're caught with drugs. Okay. Or cash when you're caught with drug cash. And now, of course, we know that a lot of those cars that they're using in the street takeovers are stolen cars. So, you know, but that's well, that's I'm that becomes to try a civil anything. That becomes a civil problem between the person who caused it to be lost and crushed and the person they stole it from. Yes. Okay, we've got a suggestion for a friendly amendment. You two guys get Mary Ann made the motion. I would I'll defer to the two of you. Did, are you happy with adding that? I seem to think I, I think it's too harsh and we're never gonna get that, and I'd like to appear reasonable when it arrives in the hands of the legislators. Okay, so I think you have to know that. I think uh, our best bet is to have something simple, and there are things you can do to mark this up and change it if you wanted to. There's, it's a place to start. That's, that's what it is more than anything else. So this will be brought back as a resolution on the consent calendar. Right. That's the motion. Okay. And it's to adopt, adopt the language as it's written on the, the item. Okay. So what is the, mo what is the motion now? What, so this is... The, the motion is to uh, direct staff to bring back a resolution with the language um, as proposed um, on the consent calendar and then that it, um, the, and that the action be to send it to the council members listed, I mean, so to the uh, individuals listed in the So language. we don't send a letter out till it comes back next, next meeting. All in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it. Okay, 6A, is that where we are now? 6A is correct. Okay, 6A and 6B and we can go home, all right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a presentation here. Give us a moment to pull that up. And I apologize. We uh, originally were going to give this uh, a month ago. So we're now pretty uh, late into the six month part of the process. Uh, as a result, we're, uh, as, you, as you noted, we're getting ready to come back uh, next week to, to meet with our facilitator and talk about the next round of, of goals. So 
Again, just as a recap, back uh, in the summer into the fall, we went through this process to try to come up with a list of 20 SMART goals. Again, specific, measurable, achievable, results-oriented, and time-bound goals. And again, we did that so that we could specifically focus on, on staff's efforts for the next six months. And as we promised council, we'd be coming in with some regular checkups. So as I noted, this is kind of the, the last checkup on this round of the of six month goals uh, before we come back and uh, take a look at what we're gonna be working on for the next six months. Uh, so far, we think the process is working pretty well and it seems to be keeping us, keeping us well focused and on task. So I'll start there with the, if I go back, sorry. Uh, just, just wanted to highlight the, the photograph there. We have our uh, ESD and building and safety and planning staff uh, were gathered there. That was when they had gotten together uh, for a day to talk about uh, customer service improvements. Go ahead to the next slide. And just really quick, the, the picture there is um, we did a, uh, an employee walk out to the pier a couple of months ago. We managed to catch it on a day of pretty decent weather there. Uh, but as part of the Malibu culture, um, we're really grateful that the council continues to prioritize our positive culture change initiatives as it results to our, our recruitment and retention efforts. Uh, we wanna emphasize that these efforts are part of an ongoing effort. Um, we've initiated several um, initiatives since our last check-in in December. Many of these will be familiar to you. Of course, we did our winter closure. Uh, this initiative was well received by the staff and the general feedback was that it had uh, did lead to a boost in morale, helping to increase our staff productivity and a more positive work environment. Uh, also as part of that, we are looking to bring forward an ordinance uh, at our next meeting to formalize the winter closure and also uh, to adopt Juneteenth as a recognized holiday for the city of Malibu. Also for uh, Malibu Culture, we've been working on training and development. We've been partnering with uh, the Joint Powers Insurance Association on workshops and academies that contribute to enhancing staff skill sets and professional growth. Uh, the other thing that we're working on, and there's been several uh, kind of uh, number of efforts in the building, and I think we're gonna try to unify all those, but we're, we have a, a vision to create a, what we're calling a Malibu University. Uh, and that would be um, a formalized program for new employees uh, so that they can get a little, little more of a better understanding about how the city functions, a little bit more about the city history, uh, about our culture and whatnot. Uh, so that's something that we wanna put together to, to, to continue to support our employee culture. Uh, we're doing things to try to improve and increase our employee engagement. Uh, we've started to put out uh, surveys to the employees uh, we saw a 62% participation in the first one, so we're gonna continue to put those out and we'll continue to track those results. We're also working on a number of ways to improve our, our process improvements, uh, to improve, improve our department efficiencies through new systems and technology. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, of course, we're working through um, on the development services side, we're working through the uh, a portal, a permit portal update, and we're very excited about that. Uh, we've started to implement the, the blue beam, which is really a, an interim step uh, that will help with, uh, with tracking all that. And then of course, the, the really big crown jewel on that is the land management system, and that project will kick off later this year. Uh, HR, they're working on digitizing files, uh, doing a number of things there. Finance is also working on, on a number of upgrades, including um, budget software upgrade. IT, um, we're really just trying to work on a new vision for the IT department uh, to support all of the above initiatives. We're also conducting an IT strategic and cybersecurity plan. And uh, Public Works is working on a GIS upgrade, uh, which will also help with our development service initiatives as well. And as noted, we've been doing a number of things for employee events and gatherings, uh, just to father, uh, foster camaraderie, collaboration, uh, and to get people you know, out of their departments and out of their cubicles and to become more familiar with, with everybody else in the building. Go to the next slide, please. And then of course, we're taking a, a deep dive into staff compensation and benefits. Uh, management is currently in the review of our job classification and total compensation analysis. Uh, we're working to wrap that up. Uh, we anticipate bringing that report to city council 
uh, in the next month or so, and we intend to incorporate the recommendations from that study in the 24-25 budget presentation, and those that will be starting right around the corner. Go to the next slide, please. And again, just moving through our list of 20 goals, uh, school district separation, that remains a, a top adopted goal for the city. Uh, this photograph here was uh, actually taken from the ground breaking for the new uh, Malibu High School. Um, the subcommittee on separation continues to meet uh, weekly, and um, the city's consultants, as you are aware, are working right now on potential revenue sharing agreements, operations agreement, and joint powers agreement. Uh, towards the potential separation. Uh, we have a mediation date scheduled for uh, next March 14th. Uh, we continue to look with the, for the goal of, of introducing special le legislation for the year 2025 with the goal of unification and fall enrollment uh, thereafter. On to the next slide, please. Already touched on this a little bit earlier tonight, but uh, we're moving quickly through uh, to, to initiate the process for our city-owned vacant land survey. As the council is aware, we just recently awarded the contract for outreach and engagement to Trebby Smith and Associates, uh, and they are, uh, they've are they hit the ground running. I know that they are already meeting with, with staff and, um, and other key players. Uh, so the, the kickoff is, is moving forward, uh, and uh, they're finalizing their timeline and the deliverables uh, expected to, within the next six months. Um, right now we are forming the outreach plan with them and uh, we will be reporting that back to council. Um, staff and the consultant are also actively engaging with the planning commission, park and recreation and arts and culture commission as part of the outreach. So uh, moving forward on that, a lot to, lot to come. Housing element, uh, six cycle, um, Following the special work session held by the city council in February, as you're aware, the planning department did submit the draft housing element to housing uh, to the state's HCD uh, for review. We are expecting comments back from HCD this month. Uh, planning and the media team are currently designing outreach materials based on the latest updates, uh, and those will be ready to publish as soon as we uh, receive comments back from from HCD and we feel that we're ready to move forward with that once once council feels we're ready to move forward with that um, and then if we're able to get agreement on the latest draft then of course we will move forward on the public hearings and towards the adoption next please public safety I think we've spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about public safety tonight at least in terms of PCH safety which obviously has been a, a, a big focus for the staff here uh, over the past six months, uh, but not to, but just would uh, don't want to neglect the many other things that the staff are working on here. In, in addition to PCH safety, uh, we are working on updates to our emergency operations plan. And that's going to be coming to the city council later this spring. Also, the recent storms have provided a good training opportunity for the staff. Uh, next month, we will be hosting a series of staff trainings uh, on the emergency operations system software program. Uh, this is known as, as disaster LAN or DLAN. This is the system that is used by all cities in LA County. So we want to make sure that our staff is fully trained and, and familiar with that system. Also, uh, another effort that we've been working on is the license plate readers, the ALPR cameras. Happy to report that all the Edison contract documents have been submitted and are now being processed, and we expect to have those uh, installed within the next couple of months. Uh, we're also continuing to work on management of encampments. There was the encampment at, on Paseo Hidalgo, which was recently cleared, as well as two others. So that continues to be a, a real priority for our public safety staff. Uh, also, I know the um, we've been working on trying to get the uh, radio antenna installed at the, the park for, uh, for KBU uh, to be able to expand that emergency radio capability to the east side of town. Uh, story bowls for the antennas were installed on March 4th, and um, if all goes well, installation is expected to be completed uh, by the end of this month. Next slide, please. Uh, development services, uh, we continue to work um, very hard behind the scenes on that. Um, just a, a quick couple of things to, to highlight on that. Um, as I noted, that we introduced the, the new uh, line or key management system, uh, QLIS, 
uh, was introduced in January to help the organization and in-person flow. Uh, we're also working on and we'll be releasing a how-to video on the city's social media to showcase this new system. Uh, up, we're also working on updates to the plan submittal process for the digital plans, and that is in development expected to go live uh, later this month or next. And as I mentioned earlier, we're also working uh, to uh, with the blue beam development and that should, we were in the process of getting that installed and training and we expect that to go live by may of this year um, that's going to definitely help with us tracking projects as they come in next slide please and uh, just to follow up on development services um, as i know the current phase of blue beam development um, sorry i already mentioned that Land management system, we're working on bringing on a project consultant, uh, which was recommended in the report. Uh, that's going to help develop the timelines and lead the, and lead the project uh, to kick off by June 2024. And uh, we'll, we'll keep you um, very excited about actually what that's going to bring in terms of the staff. I know the staff is very excited about that project. And it's really going to allow us, I think, to, to move really into the, uh, into the next century in terms of being able to, to track what's happening there. Uh, next slide, please, or I'm sorry, we're already there. Um, Malibu High School, CDP, um, really nothing additional to report there. Um, since approval by Council and Coastal Commission, staff continues to conduct post-approval monitoring the environmental and entitlement conditions. The project appears to be moving along well. Next slide. Permanent skate park, I think we've uh, heard quite a bit about that in the last couple of weeks, uh, but uh, Despite a little bit of a delay there, happy to report that we are moving forward uh, with the approval of the settlement agreement with the neighboring property owner. Uh, next steps will be for city council to have a discussion about the budget and to consider designation of funds for the construction of the permanent skate park. Uh, staff is also working on the final construction bid documents with the skate park designer. Happy to move and uh, happy to move on to the next one, sorry. I so happy to answer any questions, but we're not there yet. Um, accessory dwelling units, um, we've made good progress on that. That has been submitted, um, uh, the local coastal plan amendment has been submitted to the Coastal Commission for review, uh, and we're waiting to receive their comments. So that's where that stands. Next slide, please. Coastal vulnerability assessment. Uh, we've completed phase one of the coastal vulnerability assessment and we're now entering phase two of the outreach. Uh, phase two public workshops will be conducted over the month of April. ESD staff are working with their media team to advise the community on how they can participate. Um, so we will be coming back to council uh, with an update on that once, that once we've gotten through that phase. And exterior elevated elements. Um, I know council just recently adopted that ordinance. Uh, and I know the ESD staff has put together a, um, a, an education campaign uh, for residents, developers, and landlords in Malibu to make them aware of the new requirements for that program to comply with state law. And uh, next slide. Um, we're also working on updating our geotechnical and coastal engineering guidelines. Um, we're working with our geotechnical consulting firm to update those. Draft guidelines are under review internally. Uh, due to the impacts of the winter storm, staff did have to reprioritize that project. So this is one of the ones I would say is, is moving a little slower than the others. However, guidelines are, uh, are on track to be released to the public for comment in April. Next slide, fee schedule update. I know we've heard from Mr. Tony on that. Um, in December, we, we initiated the, uh, the work on that with the Matrix Consulting Group. Uh, they began the work in January of this year. The report is expected in June, and uh, we will bring the results of that to the City Council, and that will be discussed as part of our budget review um, with the idea of a potential implementation date of July first 2024 for any adjustments to the fees. Next slide, please. And then on, on our information technology strategic plan implementation, um, we did kick off the IT strategic plan back in November. Uh, they have completed their first phase of internal assessments and staff is on track to present the report uh, in April. 
So I know they are working very hard behind the scenes to, to come up with that plan. And really that's going to give us the, uh, you know, our, our, our roadmap for how we're going to move forward um, strategically with IT for the next couple of years. So that's gonna be real key as we move into the budget discussions this next year. Next slide, promise we're almost done. Uh, Malibu Community Labor Exchange Permanent Office. Uh, cities uh, contracted design, uh, we, we're working with our design and engineering firm, Kinley Horn. They are drafting the design plans for the footprint of the permanent trailer space. Uh, we're also working with the county CEO real estate office and Santa Monica College to complete the undergrounding of utilities and parking lot for the project site. Uh, we expect to go out to bid with construction projects um, uh, before the end of uh, March or April. And the goal is to break ground on the new site by July of 2024. Next slide. Civic Center Water Treatment Facility Phase 2. I think as council is aware, the, the project has been, uh, been delayed due to the requirement to develop a cultural resource monitoring plan. Uh, city and state board are working on a plan and anticipate to have that complete by mid-2024. Um, the, this date will be, modifi will be modified based on a revised phase two boundary map. So we're waiting for feedback from um, the state. Uh, as you're well, as you're probably aware, the, the concept uh, is to take the, the volume uh, that we're, in, you know, because we can't get to the Sarah neighborhood, uh, we're looking to take that volume for, that would be sent to the treatment plant and move that to um, the Malibu Colony area. So we're waiting to hear back from the, the, the state and regional board on whether they're accepting of that plan. And we will keep the council advised on that. Next slide, please. We've heard quite a bit about our PCH signal synchronization project um, as part of obviously our P overall PCH safety. Uh, the construction is on target. Uh, we did have some uh, hiccups due to the weather conditions and needed to make some adjustments out there to the, the traffic pattern. Um, I believe those have been made at this point. Mr. DeBeau, were we, were we able to make the, the, the changes to the traffic pattern uh, for the signal synchronization project? Sorry. Uh, um, the quick answer is yes, when we're able to do that. Um, I think unfortunately we have some, we have some challenges with current Caltrans's um, <laughs> K-Rail and uh, other things, but also if we're, if we're close to the close to the intersections, it makes it really hard for us to kind of do that. But yeah, whenever we get an opportunity to have change over the traffic, we're actually doing that. Thank you, Mr. DeBell. Um, next slide, please. So that is it. We've gone through uh, all 20 of the goals that the city adopted back in September. As you can see, I think we're making pretty good progress on, on really every, pretty much all of the goals there. I just wanted to thank the city council uh, for their attention and for your, your commitment to this process and your cooperation throughout it. Uh, we do feel like it's making a difference for, for the staff and for the community, uh, and it's really helping keeping us focused on both of our our short term as well as our long term goals. Uh, so we, we like this process. We hope that the council is also finding it to be uh, to be bearing fruit. And uh, we look forward to our next engagement with our consultant uh, next week. And we'll be working on the next round of goals for the next six months. That's my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions or take any comments or feedback. Any questions before we go to public comment? Anybody online? There's one raised hand from Joe Drummond. Joe, you're on. So in this strategic plan, there should be a priority to fix the planning department and the fees, not just complete a fee study to try and justify the fees. On page five, the effective and efficient column has just a minor fix. This is not the best strategy. The study and implementation plan currently being worked on since December 11, 2023, has so far only implemented a small fix as a new queue management system for front counter implemented January 24, helping with organization and in-person flow. 
Updates to the plan submittal process are in development for digital and expected to go live by March 2024. The city definitely needs a system where residents can see what exactly is required, submit everything, and have it all clearly laid out and followed up on regularly within 10 to 12 days max. And the fees need to be applied at the beginning of a project. The city has unfortunately failed too many years in the planning metrics on this. New workflow software acquisition is Bluebeam development that apparently is initiated workflows, process, build, training, and expected to go live by May 24 for the land management system working on bringing a project consultant to help develop timelines and lead project by June 24, kickoff project during the current calendar year. An expert is needed who knows what the requirements for every permit is to work with the planning department to train them at a simple level, university level not necessary. A sliding scale of flat rates per square footage need to be implemented such as used in other cities. July 2024, implement new fee schedule. We need to study the, to fix this in the planning department, not justify high and apparently illegal fees being charged to residents like myself and attempted to be charged to residents like Jennifer DeNicola, who end up abandoning their projects. How is this serving the residents? This and the law should be advised to the newly appointed matrix consulting. To read from Ms. DeNicola's email to you recently, the city is going about the process of permitting incorrectly as well as the process of establishing fees for the permit process. The only requirement is not to recoup its actual costs. That's what firms do, not city municipalities. California law requires municipalities to establish a connection between a fee and a project and to ensure that that fee does not deter or restrict a resident from being able to build, improve, or comply. And right now, Malibu's fee structure deter residents from being able to improve their homes on small projects. It also violates the process in which homeowners should know exactly what it's going to cost city permits and building fees prior to beginning of a project. Government Code Section 66020 requires that planning and permit processing fees do not exceed the reasonable cost of providing the service or impact. 10 to 15 percent of development costs are considered typical, not over 100 percent, which is what is happening with septic approving operating permits. Um, also, geological guidelines and requirements need to be reduced for small projects and like for like fire rebuilds, which have slowed down everything. So I hope these can be taken in, especially a flat fee for almost everything like other cities do. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Those are all the raised hands. Okay, back to close public comment, back to the council table. Any issues, points, questions? Well, I just want to thank, uh, <clears throat> City Manager McClary and the staff for all the work they've done on this and and to it, it is very comforting to see that we have made progress and I think that it's a good process and I would love to see I can't wait for the 20th of next month to uh, have our meeting about what's next or is it this month this month looking forward to it anybody else Marianne, no. I'll make a quick comment. It, I, <clears throat> when you look at where we were six months or nine months ago, I think there was 150 projects. Nothing was getting done. We're making steady progress in these things, and you know, hats off to not only the people making it happen, but the tracking system that's letting us see the progress on it too. So it's, it's essential for project management to have a good tracker, and this is this is a good one. Although the print is so small. <laughs> Alexis is smiling over there. In order to read this, I had to put it on a, a monitor that's about the size of a wall, but I, and I have good eyesight. So anyway, um, I do hope that there's some things that we can take off this uh, list as accomplished, because there's things that are pending. It just when we did this six months or so ago, there were 25 to 40 items, and we had to cut it down to 20. Those items are still out there, and we need to get them done. And by the way, I would uh, emphasize the IT security area. Um, I will tell you as a, a banker and what we get from the regulators, IT security and uh, uh, it's a backbone of your system, not only to spring off of and run your place, but it's also the vulnerability that can kill you. So we need to make sure that's in, in top order. And public safety, the cameras, the uh, preparation for next fire season are critical. We need to get those done as soon as we can. That's my two cents. Bruce? That's what I thank the city manager for the report. Thank you. Um, 
So I have some questions on, you know, maybe we're going to discuss this on the 20th, but, you know, how do, how do things move on when we've, you know, we've got several of these things that have moved to the next thing. The ADU is now with Coastal and we're awaiting comments from there. Um, the um, high school project is under construction, so it doesn't need nearly as much day-to-day um, -day look by the, um, the staff. So how are those things still being accounted for while not, while still being shown here, but not necessarily needing the intensive where we can get some of those other items um, moved up onto the priority list without getting back to 150 items on the list? Sure, sure. A uh, great, great question. Um, so, yeah, obviously, naturally, you know, as we get through these, they're going to come off the list then as, or more than likely will come off the list as the priority project. Of course, that doesn't mean that we won't still follow up on them or work on them or pay attention to them. They just won't necessarily be identified as one of the top 20 goals. Much the same way we've, we've said that, you know, not everything has to be identified as a top priority goal in order for staff to be able to work on it. I think we, I know we did, we identified a process in there where we could still identify, you know, job tasks and things that we could work on as opposed to say putting that on the parking lot list, which, you know, and then which is what we'll take a look at when we come back on the 20th and, and consider goals going forward. So. Yeah, absolutely. There's going to be a process where some of these are, are, you know, some may continue, but absolutely the expect expectation is that we can get these goals done. Uh, they'll they'll come off this list. We'll, like I said, continue to give them whatever necessary administrative support that they need. Um, but then, very much the idea would be to shift the focus then to the the next group of goals for the next six months. Okay. Um, and I do. I want to thank staff. I'm. I'm really happy to see that we're making progress on these things and we're going forward. Um, I think with the, I'm sorry, the snack shack, I'm not seeing it on here. Um, I just wanted to see a little bit more information on exactly what the steps are to get that implemented. Um, you know, I know Parks and Rec had a the commission, had a meeting about it. Uh, just little bit more detail so at least I or maybe the public has an understanding that are following that project of what the design steps are and then how it moves through um, the process going forward so and we can talk about that more on the 20th that's fine not a problem Happy um, to do so. thank you and I just I kind of wanted to address a couple of Joe's comments um, just I have a familiarity with this and everything and the a lot of the reason in the past why we haven't necessarily had flat fees is because not every project as it's submitted ends up getting approved so if you did have a flat fee that took you from planning into building safety and such um, there are things that could happen to it that don't necessarily um, align with what the project was originally when it was submitted um, so you know you, you've got to kind of compartmentalize those things so that when it's submitted it's one review and then when it moves on and it goes into the next it may have changed and gotten larger or smaller depending on what the scope of work is so those are some of the things um, why the city in the past hasn't necessarily gone to a flat fee all the way across and while it would be nice we're not like other communities we have special requirements depending on what neighborhood you are in um, geological areas uh, some places have a wastewater treatment plant, so they don't necessarily have as intensive review when they're going through uh, kitchen and bathroom remodels. So there's so many unique neighborhoods throughout Malibu, it's difficult to just come up with one fee schedule that's going to address all of those across the board. Um, we are very unique, and our fee schedule needs to be adaptable um, in order to customize based on the customized project that's put before. I just want to kind of say that and we can go from there and look forward to that fee study being released and uh, what it brings for us. Okay. Anybody else? <clears throat> All right, I, I sort of echo the comments. I think we have made some progress. The one place that I think we, we do have to do some work on is filling the empty slots we have. I mean, I, I have 
been like two years. Uh, and I, I, I understand and appreciate the extra week's vacation and the ice cream socials and the uh, nature walks, but I don't see that putting any butts in the seats to get this done. So I'll, I'll work, we'll do more of that when we get the meeting on the 20th. I just think that is, I mean, if you, if you look, read the staff report, you know, the very first page, it says, we agree there are not enough human resources to take on the projects we need to get taken on. So we, if we don't fix that, we're always going to be in school. So with that, any other comments? Joe, you want to say anything? No, Mayor, I appreciate it. I think we'll, we'll defer to the 20th and yeah. keep things moving. Okay. Uh, this is a receiving file. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, so we don't need a motion. We're, we're receiving file. Let's go back to 7B or 6B. 6B. Mid-year commission activity reports. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is also a, a receiving <coughs> file. This is an opportunity for council to hear reports back from the uh, Memorial Youth Commission, the Arts Commission, Parks and Recreation Commission, our Public Safety and Public Works Commission. Also an opportunity for the council to amend any commission assignments for the current fiscal year, if the council so uh, desires. Um, I don't see any of the commission chairs here to give any comments, but we do have department heads here. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or go over any specifics for the council. Okay. Any hands? There are no raised hands. All right. Back to the we'll closed public comment, back to the dais. Anybody want to start? Sure. I, I just want to say how pleased I am with the Arts <clears throat> Commission has become so active and so productive. And I really appreciate all the support they're getting from the same person who's also uh, helping the Parks and Rec produce a lot. You're a very busy person, and we really appreciate your contributions, Kristen. Youth Commission also. Well, I didn't even mention the Youth Commission. <laughs> so I apologize for leaving out the Youth Commission, but you, you've got a lot of tasks and you keep them going, and I really appreciate that. And it's it's working well for us. Anybody else? Doug? I'll just make the comment, having several of us have been commissioners uh, that have been on the city council or currently on the council. It's not only a great opportunity to learn the ropes of the city, but there's so much value added by these people being in these commissions. And it, it's, it's an amazing volunteer effort. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time at city council, but these people spend a lot of time in, in these commissions. And no greater sign of that than uh, the Parks and Rec issues of the last uh, few months, the Arts Commission, Public Safety. I mean, constantly these people are being called on to serve the city and much appreciated. And I'm very proud of the work they get done. It's, it's amazing. And, and thanks to the staff that uh, oversees them, whether it's uh, Susan or Kirsten or whoever, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work goes into this and we appreciate it very much. Anybody else, Mary Ann? Uh, the only thing, I kind of had a comment, um, and it sort of came out of the, the Planning Commission meeting with the um, crosswalk. Is there um, a policy or can we initiate a policy to have uh, public works, public safety, um, possibly look at those while they're going through the planning process, um, just so we can have maybe some comments placed upon the item to clarify things. I'm not trying to add more bureaucracy to the, the process or anything, but just so we get some um, feedback from residents um, to the functionality of some things and maybe answer some questions that we maybe could have avoided the delays in that approval of that. Just put it out there. Anybody else? Bruce? Okay, I, nope. I appreciate the reports. Yeah, I appreciate. I got just one, and I'm, again, I'll bring this up when we get to the meeting on the 20th. One of the things, and it sort of ties it a little bit to what Marianne was saying. I would like to. We have a lot of issues, public safety issues, for example, that with the crosswalk, we sent the public safety issues and gave them to the planning commission. 
we're over in the Public Safety Commission. I got a whole bunch of people that do that all the time, and in some cases, they're probably better equipped to come up with some of those answers. So on the 20th, I'd just like to find a way if there are issues that are sitting in the Planning Commission or even at the City Council that we can send back to the, to the Public Safety or one of these other groups to take a look at. Uh, I'd like to find a way to do that. I just think that will make us more effective in making some of the final decisions that we make. So that'll be on the 20th. I'll work at that then. So with that, just to receive and file. I just, re just need to receive and file, Mr. Mayor. Sorry. Right, so let's receive and file it. And then that's the end of the meeting. Ready to adjourn. We're Kudos done. to public safety as well. I apologize for not mentioning it earlier. Say what? Kudos to oh, public yeah. safety. It's amazing the depth of uh, information that's available and the, the devotion of those people and what they're doing to make Malibu safer on a day-to-day -day basis and also in preparing for emergencies. I agree. All right, we're adjourned. See you next two weeks. <laughs> no, no, see you.